we would like to make sure that the general public doesn't have the ability to turn around and make wildlife management decisions. Agree. Seems like a no brainer. That's the exactly what but, I'm saying. Is like how does you it- know what to, to <laughs> do that? We got to have the general public vote on it. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's so so there you yeah. go. A hunter podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now. It's mm-hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4,800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost and we know that we walk away when we come back it's going to be a great looking food plot for anybody that's looking to try deer grow if you use the code hunter 15 that's h-u-n-t-r-1-5 at checkout for deergrow.com and save 15 percent on any of your deer grow products it's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself better food plots bigger deer and we're back new hunter podcast episode 173 even though nick had a dream about Four hundo? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like four hundred something. I don't remember. That's like, wow. I don't even know. Five years away from yeah, now. It's a good bit away. Holy cow, that's crazy. It's hmm. like the year twenty thirty. Yeah, we'll probably have a million subs by then. <laughs> you are dreaming, huh? Yeah, nice protection <laughs> there, Nick. Uh, let me see on the growth rate and carry the one, maybe. What's what's your exponential? You got to carry the one, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. You know, do you can do your piece if you yeah. want. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys for being here. Uh, whether you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube, uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, give us a like, follow, subscribe. You know, whatever is appropriate for the channel that you guys are on. Uh, you know, we see that stuff. You know, we, we appreciate you guys being here. And uh, you know, here we go. Here we go. Uh, it is March, February twenty second, but it's March twelfth yeah. if yeah. you're listening to this. Mm-hmm. On the first day, at least. Boy, I feel like it's kind of perpetually been February 22nd for about a week now. Dude. Yep. Doesn't it feel that way? Being a short month, this has been a long February. It's been a long February. This is an extra long It's a leap year. Yeah. 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 It's my wife's birthday today. Nice. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. 39. Mm-hmm. Wow. Dude, there's a lot of birthdays packed right in here. What's oh, nine dude, months prior February. to right now? October? No, no, no. No, no, no. It's like June? June or July. A lot of babies made in June, July. Mm-hmm. Summertime. Yeah, Fourth of July, babies. Fourth uh, of July. Uh, there you go. Hmm. Fireworks. Boom. Fireworks. Fourth <laughs> of July. Boom. <laughs> That's <laughs> us. There it is. And it's over. Yeah. Mine's, cause mine's coming right up. I'll be 31 in March yeah. 3rd. A lot of, lot of birthdays seems to be passed. Wasn't that one of these guys yesterday? Was there March 7th? Johnny. Uh, No, Bo. Bo? Bo's the 7th. I'm April 3rd. I never would have guessed Bo was older than me. Would you? He's like a year older than you. That oh, I know. Count. I know. But I would have said like 20, 26, 27. Really? Yeah. He's been I'm at, off sometimes. Been at it for a while. Man. Nick, how old are you? I'm 26. Whoa. I know. I, don't I keep giving it. you a lot of like good shade there. I'm like, ah, oh, Nick's like 23 or yeah, something. I look 23. Yeah. So, well, I was going to say 16, <laughs> but yeah. Dude, this is funny. Last year, I got carded at the movie theater to see a rated R movie. Wow. I was like, is this a joke? I was like, I know I look young, but I'm not that young. The usher was like, does it seem like a joke? <laughs> <laughs> Give me your ID. Yeah. He's yeah. yeah. like, yeah, I'm not buying it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm right. Gonna, it, it'll benefit Litoski. me. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. what, what was the movie? Uh, I don't remember. Some thriller. Mm. Yeah, I don't remember. Mm. But It's come out with really... Did you see that uh, Thanksgiving? Yeah, dude, I watched it last night. Super dumb, it's right? It's funny you say that. I, It was gruesome. Uh, it was yeah. unnecessarily gross. I just shut it off. Yeah. I Tim Dillon was in it, so I was like, eh. You guys are into those like thriller, horror I, I like. Oh, dude, I like a good thriller. Like yeah. a nice plot twist. Yeah. They just they don't make good movies anymore for the most part. Like they're hard they're hard yeah. to find. Yeah. Hard to find. So if anybody's got any suggestions, you can leave those in the comments. <laughs> We're always looking. You know who's a good source of uh, you know, media influence for me is, is Alex. Alex. That's yeah. asked me be like, Oh, you should watch so, he's so. A, and I always take the recommendation yeah. and he's he's pretty on point. He's, with a, that, he's yeah. a cinematographer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He appreciates sure. film. Good it, film. Good film. Good film. I am a big movie guy. Like I really 
it's su- it sucks that yeah. you know just movies aren't to the quality that uh you know Hol- Hollywood's obviously a weird place and it's fine as that's yeah and there's kind of all going away but like I, I do miss the a good movie yeah. kind of digging their way out of covid and then you know adjusting with the netflix and hulus and apple you know side yeah. of thing like i mean there's a lot of you know pretty a list type stars making netflix and hulu movies and apple movies a lot of apple stuff, stuff. Like i don't have access to any of that i don't we really don't, yeah i don't have the apple stuff oh yeah i've watched a few of the apple stuff i don't know nothing uh, like there's pretty good yeah i like apple tv yeah it's good mm-hmm. stuff i get free stuff with like the phone or you can whatever afford that yeah. Wow. It's like it's like seven bucks a month. <laughs> wow. I don't even pay for our Netflix or our Hulu account. Netflix. They're all like shared accounts. Yeah. Those both keep jumping in price. I know. I wouldn't know. Just little by little, they keep sneaking in an extra three bucks a month, and you just don't pay attention to it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, not much going on in February for us. Kind of just. Drifting along here, shit yeah. hunts. Well, since yesterday, we're just we're back in the studio here the day after we had Bo and Johnny in, yep. in the studio. So we're we got Bo builds going on. Uh, we, we got do. the RX eights in. We uh, do. You know, got the Easton builds coming together. So I'm mm-hmm. dropping those off at mm-hmm. Tim next week, and uh, we're heading to Iowa still next week. I know we've been talking now for the for a while. So, but exciting. We'll get boots on the ground, yep. and we'll be at the Iowa Deer Classic. That's all coming up. And uh, so in the meantime, we've got a guest today. Dan Gates is. I'm not going to try to. Get the uh, Coloradans for responsible wildlife management. Amazing, and that oh, good. Well done. Thank so you. and I'll, yeah, he'll uh, he can elaborate on that. But so Dan was introduced to me as the wolf guy, right? As yep. we, and I know he's so much more than that. Uh, there's a lot of like hunting initiatives and uh, you know, uh, I, frankly, battles I think going on behind the scenes with uh, anti hunters. Yeah. And obviously, there's there's a big incentive for us to have a positive influence on not anti-hunters, but, but non-hunters, right? Sure. The non-hunting community, um, that's that's most people. So uh, Dan's from Colorado. Mm-hmm. Uh, the wolf issue is obviously in, in a, several states now, most recently Colorado, yeah. I think. And uh, Puts us in a cool position because this is, um, this is kind of a little <clears throat> bit more of a foreign subject, I think, for you and I. You know, we live heavily in the whitetail states of the east or, or the midwest. And, you know, even though some of the northern midwest states are dealing with wolf issues and, You know, they're also, whether you're in the northern Midwest or you're in the northeast, there's also a lot of liberal states um, Mm -hmm. when you talk about the anti-hunting movement and stuff like that uh, and threats against our hunting lifestyle. You know, it still seems, you know, the West often seems a little foreign to us just because it's a completely different lifestyle in terms of hunting, different um, challenges that they're facing. (laughs) Um, you know, season types, access, opportunities. Yeah, well, it's different in a lot of ways. You know, it's uh, just generally speaking, a lot more public land the further west you go, more nomadic species, you Mm -hmm. know, so elk and... Mm -hmm. I don't know if you call muleys a nomadic species, but probably to to a degree more Mm -hmm. than whitetails for sure. So, yeah, very different in that respect. But also, I I know that Dan is involved with some, uh, like, I think, federal initiatives Mm -hmm. or, you know, things that could someday be used against us in in the whitetail states. So, it's like, this is going to be a a learning, I think, uh, podcast for us. It's just a lot of... uh, uh, asking dumb questions, which is, you know, what I do best to, to, and learning from Dan. And then, um, and hopefully we can take something away from it. So, yep. Let's bring in Dan. All right. And we got you, Dan. Yep. All I'm right. on, sir. All right. Well, we appreciate you joining us this morning early out in, uh, your, what are you mountain time out there? Mountain time. I'm in uh, Canyon city, Colorado. Yep. So we appreciate you joining us early this morning and, and having this conversation. We kind of entered there a little bit prelude that, you know, this is, this conversation will be probably a little bit more foreign than some of the conversations that Jared and I have on the podcast, but that's also where we tend to get the most intrigued and, and, you know, um, kind of dive into the nitty gritty of it because it, it becomes something that we can try to relate to what we deal with on an everyday lifestyle, even here out East. So Dan, if you would just kind of out of the gate, um, maybe give the listeners at home just a little background on, on who you are and, and, um, you know, what the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management is is about. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to sit down with you guys. Uh, I won't say that I've become a celebrity over the last four months, but I've done about 40 freaking podcasts because of all <laughs> the, the stuff that we're having to deal with. And I've got a bunch scheduled for the rest of this week and next week and the, and the weeks after. So we appreciate the opportunity to be able to ride the coattails of uh, the messaging opportunities that you guys provide, because we're in a, we're in a battle here that we need to we need to have some help. We need to have some help in messaging. We need to have some uh, help in fundraising and outreach. 
And uh, these topics that we'll discuss today are going to affect, you know, a lot of people in the West, but it could trickle down to a lot of people in the East, in the Midwest as well. So uh, to cut to the chase, I'm the executive director for the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. That's an organization that we formulated seven years ago. It's a 501c4. And so that allows us to do a little bit different lobbying efforts and stuff on uh, uh, advocacy and education and so forth. We're the only organization in Colorado that's got full-time lobbying representation at the Colorado State Capitol for sportsmen and women. And so while all the, all the other acronym groups that somebody might be members of, um, they're limited on what they can do for you know, advocacy and lobbying efforts, unless it directly affects their organization. And they're still limited to about 10% of their total expenditures when it comes to lobbying efforts hmm. and or advocacy work on, on ballot initiatives or campaigns or so forth. So the mission of the organization is to enhance, promote, and defend the North American model of wildlife conservation and responsible wildlife management. And I want to preface that with, with we are not a membership organization. We don't give you a magazine. You don't get a free knife. You know, we don't do banquets and fundraisers for the, for, you know, raffles and stuff. We take contributions in from other organizations, entities, individuals, landowners to help us provide the service that we are doing and the education campaign based upon the North American model and a responsible wildlife management. That being said, uh, the fights that we have been fairly expensive. The fights that we are in now are extremely expensive. And so partnering with those other organizations of the 501c3 status is imperative, not only for sustainability, but but sustainability in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm also the president for the Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters Association. And I sit on the vice chair position for the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project and a bunch of other boards and committees that are all circulated around this type of stuff. And for whatever the hell it's worth to show to show what we have to do to be able to engage in a lot of the things in the West. I was appointed by this governor to the Colorado Habitat Stamp Committee and confirmed by the Colorado Senate, the General Assembly. And I was also appointed by his predecessor as well. And I want to say that because I didn't vote for either one. I'm a right wing Republican and they are left wing Democrats. And the one that we have in office now is a, a animal rights extremist. And his husband is even worse. And uh, we, we are in a landscape in the West as a whole that, you know, it, it looks like the low hanging fruit to our adversaries and our opposition. And I'm not just talking about Colorado. I'm talking about from Colorado all the way to California and from Canada to Mexico. And the agenda that is being driven is such an extreme agenda that it just doesn't have to do with wildlife. It has to do with agriculture production. Mm -hmm. It has to do with oil and gas. It has to do with public land use. The attacks and the assaults of what they are throwing out at so many different levels, at so many different state levels here and across the West, uh, you can tell that it's a, a very structured strategy-based strategy, strategy -based agenda that they are trying to accomplish. And with what we're dealing with right now in Colorado, the, the low-hanging fruit are mountain lion hunters, bobcat harvesters, fur bear trappers. And uh, they've even said, the adversaries have said, we take the low-hanging fruit, we chop the branch off, we chop the tree down, then we go into the forest. Right. And which which I find as a hypocritical statement because they don't want anybody to go into the forest, uh, hmm. especially to cut trees down. Right. But, but that's their analogy is to turn around and start where they where it's easiest in their minds and then work their way and clear cut everything to where they don't have to worry about everything from mountain lion hunters to deer hunters to elk hunters to bear hunters to fur bearing hunters or whatever. So Dan, when they, when they focus on that predator aspect of things and look at it as a low hanging fruit, is that mainly in the assumption that, you know, the anti hunters and the non hunting public see those, you know, big carnivores, especially as these kind of mystified animals that, you know, of all of the things out there that we hunt and or trap, like they're the ones that, you know, tend to be the ones like, you know, don't, don't kill the wolves. Don't shoot the bears. Don't shoot the mountain lions. Is that is that what they're leaning on, or or their their focus of why they're attacking that side first? It's it's easier for them to justify through uh, uh, catchphrases and cliche terms on how to mislead the the middle of the road public. Mm -hmm. They know that they're against the the sportsmen, and we know that we're against them. But it's that it's that seventy or eighty percent in the middle that they're trying to mislead. And the easiest way to do that is to convince that public 
that target audience that we consider to be most vulnerable on a very volatile landscape is, is for them to lie and deceive about first and foremost, you don't eat wolves and you don't eat bears and you don't eat mountain lions and you don't eat fur bearing animals. And while some of that can be, you know, extrapolated out to, to where it's not palatable, mm -hmm. other, other sides of it are very palatable. Bear and mountain lion, for instance, are, are very palatable items. And, and for what we have in Colorado, even though we can't harvest wolves, and they'll probably never be able to harvest wolves, even though we just reintroduced wolves through a public ballot initiative. Mountain lions and, and bears are big game animals, and they have to be prepared for human consumption. Not only do they have to be, the overwhelming majority of sportsmen that harvest a bear in a mountain lion want to prepare it for human consumption. Right. I mean, they, that, that's, that's part of the, the food chain, the food source, and they, and they appreciate that very much. The antis are lying and deceiving the general public that none of that is in it, that none of that is edible. They don't mention the fact that it's illegal not to prepare it, but they specify it that is that it is inedible. Hmm. And so the lies and deceit is easily transformed into a belief from the non hunter that don't know anything one way or the other about regulations and game management and the North American model and, and so forth. And I think that capturing those lies and those smoke and mirror shell games from our adversaries and then transforming that into education and truth to the general public provides an education to that target audience that we're talking about right to where they can be they can formulate their own opinions as opposed to listening to the lies listen to the fallacies and then but base their their uh, perceptions and their opinions on facts and data and science and truths and not falsehoods mm-hmm Hmm. How many currently in, in Colorado, how many hunters and trappers are there in the state? Well, as far as total numbers, which is hard to quantify, we have a very limited amount of trappers. Yeah. And the reason being is because back in 1996, there was a ballot initiative that changed the Constitution. It was a constitutional amendment to ban the use of foothold traps, body gripping devices, and cable restraint devices. Wow. We lost that 52 to 48%. So the only thing that we've been able to use since then advocationally is cage traps. Holy you can't use cow. Anything but cage traps on public and private land if you want to do it for recreation. Now, there are 30 day exemption permits available for human health and safety, sure. protection of private property, agricultural protection, and livestock. Livestock. Protection. Yep. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's so limited and so restricted of what you can and what you can't do. Uh, but the, the cage trapping has been the only thing that's been utilized since then. So our numbers in, in Colorado are substantially less than what they might be in other states, especially in the eastern states and the midwestern states. Already a, dec you, a declining breed, even in our area, you know, compared yeah. to what it was. Is that for yeah. all fur-bearing species? Like even fo fox and coyotes, you can't use foothold traps in, in Colorado? Nope. Wow. Yeah. Wow, I had Absolutely. no idea. Try to get a fox yeah. in a cage trap? Good luck. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and actually, you know, that, that, that brings up another point just on the trapping side of it, that, that because trappers are very adaptive and because they, they have learned, um, through, you know, trial, trial and error and process of elimination of what works and what doesn't work, we've actually become fairly prolific and, and proficient at being able to trap with cage, <laughs> cage traps. Mm -hmm. but, wow. but even though cage traps were still on the list, now they want to turn around and ban the use of cage traps because because they, they find that, that we did adapt and we did, you know, modify our uh, obje objectives on, on how we were going to do things and what we we're going to do. So they're like, well, we didn't think they were going to be efficient, but now that they're efficient, yeah. we don't want you to use them. Um, I mean, are and, they not considering then, so case of point, let's say they, you know, they've already made a huge swipe at the, the fur bearer side with the trapping aspect, you know, let's say the cage trap thing goes through as well. I mean, what are what are their solutions to population management for these carnivore species and these fur bear species? Zero. They have no suggestions, no recommendations, no alternatives. It's just the fact that you don't do it. We don't want you to do it. You shouldn't do it. Uh, we don't have any reasons except for the fact that that we don't want you to. Now they'll they'll give they'll give mistruths and and misguide the general public. But they, they quote their science, not the science of, of science right. professionals, managing science professionals. Uh, but but the, but to cut to the chase, Jeremy, it, it's 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 
no no harvest is what they would like none realizing the fact that that if we don't harvest mountain lions in this case the mountain lions are still going to die mountain lions are going to die by the means of government trappers or government hunters mm. whether it's federal or state uh they're still going to die and who's going to pay for that the tax taxpayers who pays for it now sportsmen and women right and so and it's and it's a conservation model not a conflict resolution and and to that point i'll say i run and operate for 37 years of, of human animal conflict resolution business i've had a business longer than most of you guys have been alive especially the kid there in the back who looks like he's 22 now uh, that's better than i said hey, right? 22 hey? 26 he's 26 <laughs> <laughs> so but 37 years i've run that business and and i've watched the changing demographics of colorado uh, to the point to where, you know, we had 2.9 million people back in 1996 when, when we lost trapping, we got 5.9 virgin on the, on the Holy bridge of, cow. of 6 million. And, uh, and so the population has changed mentality wise, perspective wise. A lot of people moved from out of state. They didn't all breed here. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but the, you know, the, the, the influx of California people or Eastern people or, yep. or Texas people or whatever moving here and bringing their ideologies and a lot of their ideologies, I have to, I have to mention, were more middle of the road. It's that they didn't have a pro or a con because right. they never had to live with it before. And then when they get here, then they have lies and misguidance yep. from agenda-driven extremists, and yep. then it starts to alter their beliefs to some degree. But I honestly believe that people are not stupid. I think they're just ignorant on the subject matter. Agree. And if you give them the facts, they're going to make the right decision because they care about wildlife and they care about our natural resources. Yep. Yeah, I don't well, we think you'd find anybody, you know, whether you're you're for or against. I mean, that's the hardest thing. Um, there's a guy, uh, Dr. Dave Samuel here in West Virginia, who uh, wrote a book years ago called No Hunting, K-N-O-W. And a lot, of, a lot of that book talked about the wildlife-human conflict and especially the fact when you start to talk about um, the anti-hunting and the non-hunting public, the relationship that like many sportsmen and women care more about wildlife than the anti hunting people do. They just, yeah. it's from different points of view and different perspectives. And to try to get then the non hunters, right. Those moderates essentially that have no position in the middle to understand that I can be a hunter or a trapper and love wildlife more than the people who all they try to do is keep me from having any ability to harvest those animals. And it's, it's a tough thing to, to do that to your point the facts that are flying around and the you know the different campaign messagings that are put out there from a falsehood is you know especially in today's society and media it's very convincing i mean people stick to what they see in facebook and instagram and that's what they gravitate towards whether it's a lie or not well and you know the best way to get people to understand where you're coming from is to put them into that situation and while i can't talk to damn near six million people I'm in a lot of people's houses. I'm in a lot of their businesses. I'm on their property. We run a small conflict resolution business, myself and my son. And, uh, you know, we're, we have government contracts and we have Department of Defense contracts and utility infrastructure contracts and power plants. And, and we do residential and commercial and industrial and agricultural work as well. We got some, you know, we got, I think, six school districts that we're doing work for now. And uh, th that's when you get a chance to educate those people, they say, Oh, well, we have this issue. We have to take care of it now. And you have to do it like this. Well, first and foremost, you got to be able to turn around and, and, and analyze it mm -hmm. and then, and then figure out a compromise or negotiate with a potential customer, especially when you're talking about government stuff, but you have to educate them just as much as you do the general voting public, because they're not wildlife savvy for the most part, or if they have had an occurrence or an, a circumstance with wildlife, it's been, it's been on a very limited basis. It hasn't been in their in their power plant, or it hasn't right. been in their water treating plant, or it hasn't been in their attic or their crawl space, or hasn't been in the nursing home or a shopping center, or or Lowe's or a Menards or a Home Depot. Uh, those are things that people just take for granted. I mean, we we do a bunch of bird strike programs for small airports. Mm -hmm. uh, we do we do bird strike programs for hospitals that have uh, flight for life helicopters there. You can't have birds sitting on the roof where the helicopter pad is because right. if it sucks the things in through the turbo, it's likely going to crash into the hospital. Those are things in, in society that people don't normally pay attention to. Ask people on your podcast, how many how many birds do you see at an airport? 
not very damn many. And it ain't because they don't go there. It's <laughs> right. because they're killed in the process because they don't want them to turn around and take airplanes down. Yep. These are things through society that we have to live with. And, and everybody says, well, they were here first and we need to go back to like it was. Well, then, then a lot more people are going to get sick and die and you're going to have rodent issues in your food supply and you're going to mm-hmm. have birds in your helicopters and you're going to have power outages because of squirrels and snakes. And, and there's things that we have to deal with. Well, that's no different than escalating that conversation to science-based wildlife management when it comes into 78 game species in Colorado with 961 species of wildlife. There's components that have to be incorporated into all that because we are here. We are part of the ecosystem. We are part of the structure. And I'm not saying everything has to die. There's management objectives and habitat models that you can do and alterations to create a better landscape for the wildlife. But in the meantime, they still need to be managed. And the model that was created, you know, essentially 140 years ago that was actually put into writing by Valerius Geist and Shane Mahoney allows us to go on the coattails of what our forefathers laid out. And that plays into conflict resolution. It Mm -hmm. plays into public trust. It plays into management of all species for the benefit of the good of all species. What the animal extremists are doing is they want their piece of the pie. First and foremost, they say that, well, it's my wildlife. No, it's our wildlife. Mm -hmm. And sportsmen and women are paying so they can have their wildlife and bitch about us managing and recreating and consuming that wildlife. But we're doing it for them just as much as we're doing it for us. And because of where we live in the United States, they can bitch and moan and groan and complain about it. Yep. In other in other countries, they might not be allowed to do that so much. Right. Uh, but they have that right here. But we have a we have a structure and we have a model that was created that all game agencies adhere to. The majority of sportsmen and women at least recognize it, if not fully understand it. And the general public would would relish the fact to know that their wildlife and their natural resource, resources are so well taken care of and that we were stewards of it. It's just that that five or 10 percent of the extremists on the on the left, they don't want any of it. Yeah. They don't want us to use their wildlife. They don't want us to use our wildlife. They don't want us to be on our public lands. They don't want us to have anything to do with it unless it benefits them. Mm-hmm. And that's a selfish minded way to turn around and take care of the public trust uh, natural resources and wildlife, in my opinion. Dan, do you feel like a state like Colorado, because of the amount of public land, BLM land and stuff that you have there, does that put you at a disadvantage versus a state like where we're at in Pennsylvania or Ohio that is primarily private land? I think it does to some degree. Uh, you know, I can pop numbers off all day long and if people pay attention to them, they're relevant. If they don't, they just think, well, he's just a, a number geek, but we've got 26 million acres of public land in this state. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a significant amount of private land. A lot of the wildlife lives on private land and it, and a lot of the wildlife goes back and forth between private and public land. And, and you talked about earlier when you guys were talking, uh, you know, elk, for instance, um, I think a bull elk has a home range of around 63,000 acres. Uh, you know, you stop and think of that, but they might migrate in, in the wintertime. They might migrate right. 50 or hundred miles from their original point of origin. Yeah. Whitetails don't do that. Right. You might get, you might get one lunatic whitetail that wants to go on a walk about, but the majority of them don't No. And, uh, you know, a, a cow elk's home range is somewhere around 38,000 acres. That's that's incomprehensible to most people that are yeah. hunting forty acre tracks or one hundred and sixty acre tracks. One hundred percent. Yeah, you know, and so and then you and then you magnify that to it's not just that elk, it's a herd of elk, and maybe that herd is forty, or maybe it's four hundred, maybe it's a thousand, and and I mean you might have a bunch of whitetail on a property, but how many times have you seen a thousand whitetails in one location? Yeah, you um, don't. <laughs> and the, the west is the west has a different. A different landscape just like the north the, the mm-hmm. migrating caribou herds and so forth mm-hmm. i think the public land issue is something to where people they relish the fact that, that that it is there for their use but a certain small minority hate the fact that we utilize it for our consumption mm-hmm. and and whether that's oil and gas whether it's logging whether it's wildlife but those same groups will turn around and advocate to put giant solar wind turbines and freaking solar 
panel farms on that property, taking away wildlife habitat and taking away the yep. ability for wildlife to be able to use those as migratory corridors anymore. So there's a there's a there's a land use component that I think people move to the west, and that's one reason why we've been so overpopulated and in such a fast pace, because of the vast amount of public land and natural resources. Mm -hmm. I think that the farther down the road we get, probably when I'm dead and gone, I mean, I'm 60, so you figure, I don't know, what do I got another 10 to 20 years left on to be able to, you know, flap my lips and try to get people to understand <laughs> stuff. Uh, but if, if we don't figure out a way to educate that public about public land use and about wildlife conservation and natural resource conservation and water conservation, if we don't figure out a way to, to educate them, who's going to do it? Because they're not educated enough to see where it comes from, where it's at, and where we need to go with it. And I'm I'm fearful of that down the road because we have proven models. We have proven objectives. We have science on our side. But when you're breeding people like locust on a cornfield, it's kind of hard to, to educate them in a manner that they see benefit of to themselves. Yeah. And if they don't see benefit to themselves, they're less likely to turn around and provide any input to it that is actually beneficial to the cause. It, it seems so like counterintuitive from a group, you know, and, and we talk about the you mentioned the solar and the wind turbines and stuff. You know, a lot of that is being pushed by, you know, the, the green way of thinking, the liberal way of thinking. Um, at the same time, historically, a lot of that same mindset has been very uh, high up on the environmental ecosystem and and in clean waters and stuff, but the the fact is is that by placing things like those solar farms and wind turbines and taking away all of that habitat, it 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 seems so counter to what traditionally the mindset has been in that liberal space. It's like they're they're literally displacing the environment and ecosystem in their mindset. But because they're trying to justify that this green energy is going to be better for the environment and the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I just came back from, well, I've been in Nevada more this year than I have in my life for multiple shows over the course of the last 30 days. And, uh, and, I, and we have a lot of this uh, renewable energy growth going on in Colorado. But, but if you fly across this country and see the renewable energy resources that are being utilized and i gotta i gotta say i you know i don't i don't think that that's a bad thing in, in addition to what we're trying to do collectively for a society mm -hmm. but the people that i'm dealing with on a regular basis for some unknown reason don't consider solar farms and wind energy energy farms to be part of this human infrastructure and habitat loss they just don't. It's like, well, we've got too many buildings and we got too many people and we have too many parks and too many roads. Well, do you see how much we're putting into renewable resources yeah. on the landscape that eats up the same football fields that they keep referencing that we lose every single week, every single day to, you know, to urban sprawl and development. Mm -hmm. Well, the urban sprawl and development of those, those renewable resource infrastructure facilities typically doesn't happen right on the edge of the city. It's farther out. Right. It goes out three, four, eight, 10, 12, 25 miles or whatever the hell it is. So the general person doesn't see that growth and that habitat loss. And places where I know that, you know, antelope used to, you know, roam and play mm -hmm. just like the song and where deer and elk migrate and, uh, and where prairie dogs and burrowing owls and a variety of other species, you know, lived. They don't live there anymore because of giant solar fields. Right. It's six, eight, 10,000, 12,000 acre solar fields with high fences all the way around them to keep people out. And, and the great big wind turbines, you could, you could hit anywhere in the country, I think, at this point in time and drive. You might see those wind turbines for, for miles and miles and miles on the horizon, depending on what state you're in. Yeah, we have them in our backyard and, here in Pennsylvania. They're right up here yeah, on the mountain. You know, and, and so those things have not necessarily been proven to be you know, substantially beneficial to wildlife. I know that they're not to flying wildlife uh, because of the, right. the destruction that they cause. And there again, I'm in that business, so I have a little bit of a knowledge about it. But I can tell you, you know, we are here as a species ourselves. And to try to make and, per and, and perpetuate our species and sustain our species for what we're trying to accomplish, we have an impact no matter what on the landscape. 
period. I don't care whether you drive a Cadillac Escalade or a Tesla. I don't care whether you're completely off the grid and you have a solar power deal and you burn firewood or you turn around and are on natural gas and on mm-hmm. the freaking grid and you and you take the electricity. I don't care whether you whether you go to Whole Foods or you go to Sam's. The food yep. comes from the same freaking places. I don't care whether you hunt hunt animals or you raise your own stuff. We have an impact mm-hmm. on every single level. And our adversaries have a tendency not to acknowledge their impact, but criticize the hell out of our pe- impact specifically to this conversation, our impact on wildlife that they benefit off of because we manage it and we pay for the entire system. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting, quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. We got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a six shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. Hmm. So here, here's a fairly negligent question for you. Is the, the North American whitetail model, like we talk about it a lot and it's always referenced, is that... Wildlife tr- model. Wildlife model, forgive me. Mm-hmm. Is, is that, a, I assume it's a, a document of some sort, like that's put into writing. Is that something that's referenced during lawmaking, during... You know, and part two of my question is, what what does that say about our rights as as sportsmen and women? Well, it's referenced it's referenced a lot, but it's kind of like referenced in the Bible. Not everybody yeah. can recite it, and nobody exactly. knows the Ten Commandments. But but there's the book. Yeah, I mean that's Mahoney that's the Valerius guys. I mean that's that's it. Valerius guys and Shane Mahoney. That is the model itself. Mm-hmm. The seven tenets of the model that were established with within the confines of that model were done on the on the uh, historical precedent that was done by Leopold and yep. Audubon and Roosevelt and Pinchot and Giffard and Hornaday. Uh, mm-hmm. Those are the guys that started this crap like, a, you know, 100, 140 years ago. Yep. And as it modeled into something else, the average consumer on our side might know a little bit, but start looking at the Migratory Bird Acts, look at the Endangered Species Acts, look at the Pitt and Robertson Act of 1937, mm-hmm. that's the federal excise tax, the Dingle Johnson in 1953, the Marine Mammal Act. Uh, you you throw all of this stuff. Sportsmen did that. Yeah. Anti-hunters didn't. Right. Legislators didn't. Legislators enacted what sportsmen wanted them to do. But that's the same thing that we're trying to do now to make things better. You got Recovering America's Wildlife Act. You could agree or disagree with parts and components of that. You know who's doing that? Sportsmen. Yeah. Conservation-minded sportsmen, not animal activists, not extremists. And so... For them to turn around and bastardize something that has been established in, in a proven model that all game agencies adhere to, all game agencies reference that or at least, at least structure their management objectives around the model because that's the most efficient, effective, remarkable model on the, on the planet, let alone on the continent. Mm-hmm. What we have is something we should be able to prop up. We should be able to preach about, we should be able to reference, we should be able to turn around and say, this is ours and you're not going to take it away. Well, the sportsmen as a whole maybe don't understand the full conception of the model and what it actually represents. It doesn't just represent for me and you, it represents for that, for that non-hunter, mm-hmm. and that anti-hunter. Mm-hmm. Because we're talking about wildlife stewardship in perpetuity, and that talks about all wildlife for every single reason. I think that the the hardest thing that I have is trying to convince people that we have a proven method, a proven model. We've got a proven structure. If you think it should be altered, then come to the table with suggestions, recommendations, and alternatives. But their alternative is no, don't do it. And you turn around and look at them and go, then what should we do? Well, it can't be that. Well, Hmm. what should it be? It has to be something different. Well, give me an example. Well, we come, they they never have anything. They can't do it. No, it's just don't do it. Yeah. It's like, stop, don't go. Do not cross go. Do not collect $200. And for those that play Monopoly or any point in their life, and you guys yeah. probably did this. Oh, yeah. No, we got the okay. Monopoly. Yeah. Don't pass go. We get it. Yeah. 
But the young guy in the back did not. <laughs> uh, Nick plays Monopoly. I played Monopoly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay, okay. He's, I just he make still sure. tries to buy things with Monopoly money. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, so, Dan, what is, uh, I mean, how is that referenced, like, on a, you know, a daily basis? Or is that, uh, you know, laws or bills are getting proposed, laws are getting passed? Like, what's, how is that upheld? Well, if you look at, if you look at each game agency itself, Canada and the United States, they have they have missions for their agency. Mm-hmm. It's like here, it's a statutory mission. It's thirty three one one zero one, and it's essentially to perpetuate the natural and wildlife resources in our state parks for all wildlife and Colorado residents and visitors alike. And that's take, that's taken out, out of context, but that's the generalized effort of it. Mm-hmm. Every state has that, but to do that, there has to be a system in place about government agencies. That actually that we we enact the authority to those government agencies as a society to do, make the determining factors. And one thing I'd say is if if anybody wants to go to our website and they go to save the hunt colorado.com or you check out us on Instagram or you go to our Facebook page, we have those. We did 30 second compilation videos on each one of the tenants of the model. Mm hmm. And then we put our logo on the back of it, but anybody can use that. We would encourage you or anybody else to turn around and utilize those videos because they're 30 second compilations of what each one of the tenants of the model is. And we have found that most people, while they might know one or two different tenants of the model, don't fully understand all seven and they don't understand the context within the seven. So when you reference all that stuff in a committee hearing or in a parks and wildlife commission, or at the legislature, or to just the general public, referencing those things or referencing like the proper procedure to build a house in some sense. You start with the, the you have to do the, the dirt work and the grade, then you do the foundation, and then you have to turn around and do the subfloor, and then you mm-hmm. got to do the walls, and then you get, and, and you just build it up. You get to the point to where you have your house, and then you're finishing it. What we have now is we still have the house, but wildlife management is adaptive because the changing landscape, right? like what we talked about renewable energy maybe it's maybe it's climate conditions maybe it's drought maybe it's fire maybe it's you know variety land use uh, public infrastructure you know habitat loss disease depredation you throw all that in wildlife management has to be adaptable yep to a variety of different circumstances for each one of the species and stop and think you know we've got multiple big game species in the state more than what the eastern states do so it's hard to quantify to people that don't have never hunted out here but you know when you got you got bighorn sheep and mountain goat moose antelope white-tailed deer mule deer elk bear lion uh i'm missing one anyway i mean but what do you have for big game in pennsylvania white-tailed deer bear and turkey yep that's it we have elk too but limited limited opportunity Yeah. yeah Uh, but your turkey, I mean, we consider that to be small game right? Uh, mm-hmm. out here. Yeah, it's and, basically and so, deer, bear, and limited opportunity at elk. Yeah. The, the land that our wildlife resides on is essentially sustainable wildlife habitat. Mm-hmm. L- open space with no wildlife is just open space. It's not habitat. Right. And so... So to have the wildlife be able to exist in a variety of different settings from the plains to the foothills, to the mountains, to the high peaks, to the, to the top valleys. And then you go down into the, the Western slope where it's more arid desert, like Canyon plateaus and stuff. We've got that wildlife that I mentioned at all levels through the entire state, mm-hmm. maybe not as much as some in areas as what there is in the others, but we got bighorn sheep on the su- Southeastern plains. We got mountain lion and, and, and bear and deer and elk and antelope on the southeastern plains. You get to the middle part. I mean, we got moose, and then and you throw all those other species in on top of that. But the climate, the land use, the public, the private side of it plays into a much different management objective. And it, Wyoming's the same, Montana's the same, most of the western states are the same because you have so much di- diversity on the landscape. You have so much different topography on the landscape. You have so many different restrictions on the landscape. I don't know what they do in Pennsylvania or Indiana or Ohio or somewhere, but we have multiple game management units for multiple species that overlap. Yep. So a specific game management unit isn't necessarily a game management unit for 10 species of big game. 
it might be a game management unit for one species of big game, mm-hmm. and then there might be overlap from another species. So, the, so the complexities of our wildlife managers trying to incorporate all of these nuances right. and the caveats to 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 take care of seventy eight game species is much different. And I think because there's so much public land that the public that is a non hunting public is appreciative once they find out how intricate sure. wildlife management is. And the antis utilize that as a tool or weaponize it against the managing agencies and against the consuming sportsmen and women because it seems like there's vagueness or yeah. there's inconsistencies yep. Confusion. or contradictions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so so it, it helps us, but it also creates a hindrance just because you have people that – it goes back to the other deal. It doesn't matter where the lines or boundaries are drawn. It doesn't matter the climate. It doesn't matter the, the topography, the land use. They don't want you to do it, period. Just yeah. don't. Um, it, in a, this, I'm trying not to make this a loaded question, Dan, so so bear with me here. Is is Colorado – it's the Division of Wildlife, right? Is, it's not like a DNR or anything? Or how, how is that laid out structurally? So we do we do have a Department of Natural Resources, which is one of the executive branches of the state government. Right. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife, which is a combined agency, is within that Department of Natural Resources. So it is technically – is it considered like a super agency then that goes straight up into the legislature and, and governor side of things? Or are they able to operate independently from legislation? Well, that's a hell of a good question because you, you must not really – uh, know how Colorado works. Uh, Colorado's Parks and Wildlife is an enterprise agency. It's a type one agency that has its own ability to operate as they see fit for the benefit of what the mission entails. However, they still, in theory, work at the pleasure of the governor. Mm-hmm. And because we have a governor and a first gentleman that don't necessarily adhere to that standard. There's a lot of micromanaging that comes down from the gold dome to the department of natural resources and subsequently trickles down into the agency. Yep. And while the agency manages as they need to, for the most part, there's a lot of puppeteering or string jerking or maybe even hand up the ass that, you know, where, where the ventriloquist is there, uh, our agency will not be allowed to speak on this specific mountain lion and bobcat issue because it's a ballot initiative and because the governor has not given given them the unequivocal authority to be able to do so. That's about the most so ridiculous can, thing I've ever heard. Like they're yeah, literally the yes. the Department of Parks and Wildlife. Like that is their responsibility. That's their responsibility. And the, and and to that point, I mean, even before this governor, uh, the agency was asked by the Colorado General Assembly through legislative declarations and bills and stuff that were being proposed to give their opinion. And they never gave their opinion. They never gave the facts <laughs> because the governor told them to stand down. Uh, wow. And, which is the lunacy of that is is obviously agenda driven. Now, if I was king for a day or governor for a, four years, I would say. Of course, I'm more interested in the wildlife than I am the people, yep. emotions, and, yep. and objectives and agendas. But I would say, if the if the administ- if the general assembly wants you to go talk, then you go talk. Mm-hmm. I would say that. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, even if it was detrimental, because I care so much about the resource and I care so much about the, the the historical and traditional preservation conservation perspective of what the resource provides. Uh, our current administration doesn't feel that way and it's their prerogative. It's the way the thing's written up, but it's, it's, uh, Hmm. I don't think it's in the best interest of the public trust doctrine. I don't think it's in the best interest of the wildlife. And I don't think it's in the best interest of the people that have to live on the landscape with those decisions that are being made, uh, when the facts and data and science actually might, uh, direct decisions to go another direction. Boy, we hear that a lot, like more and more to where it's just basically, you know, if you get to the root of it, it's like, how, how do these management decisions gets made? It's like, it's whatever the governor wants. Well, and I was going to say, so Pennsylvania as a game commission, we are not a super agency, right? These guys, they do have effect from legislature when it comes down to laws, things like, you know, what is the, the definition of archery and Sunday hunting in, in our case? Those are laws that have to be changed at the legislation level before the game commission can do anything, but it is independent. You move into Ohio or Indiana 
or Illinois, where there's DNRs and it's super agency, it's straight up through legislation to the governor. There is a, ma I mean, that is the master puppeteer at the well, end of the day. Uh, so, I mean, what are the examples that we've heard? So we've had Gary Alt from Pennsylvania, yep. which is a historical figure, but I think it still applies. Yep. And we've had uh, Mike Rex, and in the mm -hmm. future we'll probably have more people from Ohio on. So yep. I, I realize these are Eastern guys, but... Um, two, two very different scenarios. And, and now you, Dan, and also so a, a third mm -hmm. time here where we're hearing that, like, it's just the governor using the, uh, you know, the agencies it's that are in place that are power. supposed to be managing resources to, yeah. to, to achieve an exempt, uh, an objective. I mean, in Ohio, it's, you know, it's, there's always more than one objective, but you know, they want to make money right yeah. from, from license sales and stuff, so, which means they don't want to lose hunters. And so, uh, the guys that we speak to who are influential on, uh, gain management side are, they're all appointed. So they're like, I gotta be careful what I say. And we're like, right. okay, well, yeah, okay, <laughs> I get it. So, um, you know, but there's very, it's limited power there because of that. In, in Pennsylvania, it was, you know, the only reason that we have, you know, whatever antler restrictions, like the, the deer herd that we have now to hunt and love them or hate them. It's uh, the whole Gary all thing came about because, you know, the governor wanted to maintain, uh, you know, some sort of a, a healthy green, forest, a green stamp, a healthy yeah. forest, you know? And so the deer herd was a, just a factor of that. So he said, Hey, political immunity to, to do this. Um, and now in and I'm sure it's, you know, yeah. that's how it goes. I guess I'm probably more, these are just the people that we've talked to. So we're, you know, we're from the bottom up trying to understand, Hey, as sportsmen, as people who care about the resource, how do we, you know, have and it's it, something that I think most and, sportsmen and women have zero concept of, right? Sure. I mean, us it, included. I mean, it's only because of these conversations that we're kind of starting a lot to understand of time the, the finger pointing and stuff is, is pointed at the wrong people. They, they don't have a choice. They can't do anything. You can, you can say it's them directly, but to, you know, every conversation we have, there are people above there that are literally <laughs> saying, well, this well, is and why so in case it. in point, so Dan, this may be foreign to you, but we, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, baiting, which we feel is an issue in, in Ohio sure. because, because we're looking for a quality of resource and, and that would trickle into our hunting opportunity. So that's just how we feel about it. So that's how, why we talk to these guys in Ohio. I today feel pretty confidently that, you know, our, the conversation is, uh, one that a lot of people are having and, and landowners especially are pushing for that and stuff, but I don't honestly think that it's going to happen no. because of that. I do think it will happen at some point and it's going to be because disease, the governor gets enough pressure from the general public about over concerns for CWD that he just tells the, you know, Ohio, Hey, you're, you're done. You, you need to wrap, you need to wrap it up with the baiting thing. Cause we're getting a lot of pressure on the CWD thing, you know? Yeah. And, and I guess mission accomplished at the end of the day, but it won't have happened, you know, for the reasons that it should. Mm-hmm. No, and see, and we've got a we've got a game commission. Um, it, it used to be a parks division and a wildlife division, and then back in 2011, Governor Hickenlooper at the time, um, who I was also appointed by, that I never voted for. I just want to keep prefacing that because I was put on a bunch of different committees and stuff, and people have a preconceived notion that that you're like some side of you know, a green decoy inside right, or something because right. you were appointed. No, it was just out of uh, respect for you is what it was. Yeah, it, that or, 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 or fear. And I say this tongue in cheek, but fear that it's like, well, he's going to bitch at us one way or the yeah. other, letting bits from the inside, inside the versus outside. the out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we formulated the commission back in 2011 to where it merged both of the commissions. So now we have 11 commissioners. Gotcha. All 11 <laughs> of those commissioners now have been appointed by this governor. Right. And, and so every decision-making process that goes on goes through the commission and then it can work its way up. The problem that we see and we feel, and unless there's proof otherwise, we feel that there's an extreme uh, agenda from sure. the top to the next level, down to the commission, to the agency. The commission is essentially the, the, the decision-making board of the agency Although they might take recommendations from the scientists and for, you know, statutory issues and regulatory issues and, and models and objectives and management decision making issues. And but but the commission essentially has the ultimate decision making authority, except when it when it comes down from higher above that, you know, that there's pressure. Right. We've had commissioners even ask on a hot mic. Uh, so. Um, because we were appointed by the governor, do we have to do what the governor wants us to do? <laughs> uh, and and uh, and and the theory is, well, you don't have to, but it's more likely going to happen in this landscape, yeah, just because of the appointments that were made. Now, with that said, we do have three commissioners that are coming up for Senate confirmation 
next Thursday, which is the 29th, which I think is like two weeks before you guys actually will air this. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's worthy for people in the West to pay attention to not only what's going on in their state, but other states as well. Because that historical precedent, you know, it's it's like, well, they did it over there. Why shouldn't we do it over here? This is what they've done in this state. Why shouldn't we do it in yeah. this state? And, and, and that's where we get into another conversation on these initiatives that we'll talk about here later this morning, that you set a precedent and you see how things start to take fold and take hold of, of particular agendas that are driven by specific user groups or in this case, non-user groups, but just, you know, just, you know, just groups. And uh, I understand the the logistics of a lot of different things that other states deal with. Mm -hmm. But the politics as a whole typically don't change. If they find a chink in the armor, whether it's in their state or another state, they'll start to capitalize on that, whether it's money or whether it's money into a campaign, yeah. but it might just be constituent and stakeholder support. It might be a driven agenda driven tactics. And uh, if you really pay attention long enough, and I'm saying if you don't just go to a commission meeting for three minutes and then go on your way, but I've been playing in this landscape for since 2007, prior to the merge, I've been intimately involved with Colorado parks and wildlife, formerly the division of wildlife mm -hmm. since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and because I run a wildlife conflict resolution business and a pest control application business, uh, I'm a little bit more in tune with a lot of things that are going on. That doesn't make me any smarter. It's just that, you know, you, you might not, you might know how, how to wire a, a house, but as regulations change, yeah. if you didn't go through that licensing process and so forth, you don't really know, you you didn't know adapt. how things are supposed yeah, you just you haven't been kept up to speed on it. Mm -hmm. Sportsmen and women typically don't pay attention to this stuff, but they're starting to more. But what's funny is we're starting to see, and I'm not a social media guru, although I've become more more one of the last eight weeks because of all the crap that we're dealing with. In the last five years, at least what has been brought to my attention. Some sportsmen are becoming more involved, more educated, and more engaged. And then the other ones are becoming more uh, con contradictory. Attacked. Yeah. Uh, so so now you're giving more that's going higher up the food chain, but you're getting more and more pushback between each other. Yep. And there's little, there's more of a little bit of an insurrectionist mentality from some that then incite the others to bring their wisdom and knowledge and perspectives to the table, which is great because there needs to be an education on stuff. Yeah. You know, you talk about the North American model. Uh, if you don't know that, how do you argue against it? Right. But better yet, how do you argue for it? Yeah. And, and so when people say, well, I adhere to the North American model, name me seven tenants, name me two tenants. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like saying, uh, you know, um, I'm an evangelical individual and, and name me the 10 commandments. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We can name some of them. We know the principle is there, right? You know, the, we know the bill of rights is there, but ask anybody that to, to you know, recite the bill of rights. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's things that we, that we adhere to from structure, from policy, procedure, history, tradition, heritage, just because we can't recite it doesn't mean we don't know that it's there on our behalf, but we have to hold our game agencies accountable. But a lot of times that's doing more than holding the game agency accountable. It's holding the higher ups accountable. Yeah. The politicized aspect that, that has been driven into this and sportsmen and women don't want politics to be part of their recreation. They want to go hunt. They just yeah. want to be left, left the hell alone. Yeah. That's it. I mean, for a long time, I don't, I don't think any of us, uh, myself included, like had reason to fear, like, it, you know, mm -hmm. in my hunting experiences, it's never really limited me. I've always just at the, the core of it, I felt like, you know, if you ask you, if it, like uh whoever and answer, to justify mm -hmm. my hunting i would say be, because i want to and it's my right you know i wouldn't necessarily feel the need to justify with like well it's it's an edible harvest like i you know i can eat it or there's a there's a market for the fair fur bearing or whatever that's all great you know and that's a big part of you know reasons that people did it commercially and stuff back in the day but or you know to feed their families even today but like it's just always been because I want to. It's it's sport. I'm a, I enjoy I enjoy it, and it's my right. And the resource, coincidentally, needs to be managed. So that's why you have like the division of wildlife and stuff in place. You know, I've felt to 
ensure that that resource is there for the general public. So I don't know. I think it's just probably within the past, whatever, five, 10 years, or especially since COVID, like maybe people are more aware than ever that the government is not necessarily out for their best interest. And that seems to trickle down into the, the game management side of things as well. Well, At I least the federal government, you know? Well, yeah, but I think people are starting to recognize to some degree of, uh, and, and maybe because of COVID, but there was a lot more people that engaged in outdoor recreational opportunities during COVID because we were all cooped up. Yep. Was, don't do this. Don't touch that. Don't breathe this. Don't eat that. Don't watch this. Right. You, they didn't want you to do anything, mm -hmm. but you could go outside. Mm -hmm. And to go outside, you have to have a tent or a hunting license or a fishing pole yep. or a mountain bike or something. Right. And and it, and and now that that's backing off a little bit, at least some of those people became more aware Agreed. of what was available, and maybe a little bit paid attention to laws, rules, regulations, license components, restrictions, you know, whatever. But also saw the benefit and saw the res the, the reciprocal benefit of what sportsmen and women and conservation issues actually did. You know how many people that I ran into during COVID that said, well, I almost got a ticket because we just wanted to go fishing. We didn't know you had to have a license. Oh yeah. How the sure. hell do you not know you got to have a license to fish? Yeah. I mean, and, and so then they got their hunter education card. Then they took their kids hunting. Yeah. Then maybe only 10% of the, the last hundred percent that actually picked it up in the last three years kept doing it. But the other ones, Went and bought a gun, yep. bought some ammo. They contributed to the excise tax program at Daniel Johnson and Pittman Robertson. That they know that they can do it, and they know that maybe it's not something they want to do all the time. Yeah, but it's still there on the shelf, whereas before it maybe wasn't as much or even recognized. Sure, and I think that that might might have helped us in the long run because, you know, here in this state, our growth in applications was like 66 to 70,000 people Wow, more that applied from 2020 to 2021, which increased, you know, the, the influx of people on the landscape, non-resident and resident alike, mm -hmm. but it got 66 or 70,000 more people in that one year to understand a little bit more about conservation, a little bit more about regulation, a little bit more about stewardship. Mm -hmm. Now, will they make that right decision when it comes to a ballot this fall? I don't know, but at least they 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 have a chance to be more educated as opposed to sitting on the sidelines for the last four years and not participating at any level, yeah. not getting any license, not going outside in any any way, shape, or form. I think it's good for the cause. I'm just hoping that they'll stand up when the time is right, when things happen that are probably going to adversely affect them in some capacity, whether they want to trap bobcats with cages or they want to hunt mountain lions or whether they want to turn around and go, you know, buy a fur fur coat or buy a beaver felt hat or whatever. We got multiple initiatives going on here this year that people need to be aware of. And just because you voted for or voted against wolves in 2020 that we just recently reintroduced and released in December of 23, just because you engage in that doesn't mean that you're part of the current process right. unless you pick your pin up and you go to the poll and you turn around and click your button. I think there's a it, it's a it's a really complex dynamic here Dan and and maybe some of this I'll say is is controversial but you know obviously right there we're addressing kind of the the general public right as a whole anti non-hunters hunters you know etc. The other side of it, you mentioned the top-down pressure, and, and obviously certain states are going to have more liberal viewpoints and viewpoints that don't necessarily align with, you know, from a North American wildlife conservation model even. Where my fear is, and this was kind of my generation coming through school for my master's degree, which was, you know, going on 14, 15 years ago, is the loss of what we called the hook and bullet student who eventually – are the people that are entering the DNR to manage our resources. And what we found, at least in my generation, is there was a dramatic decrease in the number of people who were becoming wildlife professionals to go in and to be, take you know significant roles in DNRs or game commissions across the country who were uh, very deeply tied to roots in hunting, fishing, trapping. Um, what we saw was a bigger influx in people who were more what we would call conservation biologists, theorists, you know, uh, save the planet type people. 
And the reality was is, and, and people may not like hearing it, those people couldn't understand how to manage game populations in these states because they had no comprehension or relatability to hunters and or hunting and or trapping. Um, are you guys seeing that at all in Colorado from a, from a DNR standpoint or from a, a parks and wildlife standpoint? We're seeing, we're seeing uh, more people get into the field that don't have the background because I think they have an interest in wildlife. They have an interest in wildlife resources. They might have an interest in hunting or fishing because maybe they did it a little bit when they were a kid or their dad or their uncle did it. And, but, you know, I saw, I saw a, a statistic, I saw a graph that in 1900, 20% of all people lived in the city and 80% lived on the landscape. Mm -hmm. And in 1950, it was a 50-50 split. And in 2000, 80% lived in the city and 20% lived on the landscape. I mean, it's a complete reversal in a hundred years. We're seeing more of that now. I mean, what's it, what's it going to be in 2050? Is it going to be 5% to live on the landscape and 95% people live, you know, I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but if you take 50 year increments in a historical perspective, well, it's getting pretty damn close to that. Yeah. I think that we've, we've taken the, I don't want to say the killing because it's not the killing. We've taken the harvest. We've taken life and death out of so many different aspects of human life that, you know, you, and, and this is my perspective of talking to some of the old timers, which I'm becoming an old timer pretty quick. Um, but you start talking about, you know, what, what people did in 1920 versus 1940, 1941, we were in world war two. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that went into war at that time came out of the great depression and they were still on the landscape to some degree. And they'd go to grandma's house on Sunday and they'd go out and kill a chicken for Sunday dinner. Uh, they might've had hogs in the pen, you know, maybe people had their own gardens and stuff. When World War II came to an end, the industrial revolution that was created then because of the production that the United States was doing to, to be able to create a, me, a, a you know a giant weapon, yep. a, a mechanized a mechanized force, you know, hunting became less of a sustainable deal and more of a recreational deal. Case in point, look at the old field and stream magazines, sports of field magazines, fur fishing game magazines. They became more from going out and doing this for part of your life as to do it on your time off. Because when those guys came back from war, they, they actually had jobs then, right. you know, they, they actually, they lived in a house, cracker box houses next to each other. They went to work at the steel mill that was created, you know, because of the war war effort. And then we went through that same process again during the Korean war and subsequently to some degree during the Vietnam war. And there was less and less people that were engaging in outdoor recreation on a regular basis. People still did it, but not to the numbers that what they had previously done. If you if you fast forward to now in 2020s, we've got less people living on the landscape, less people having to go out, even though more people are trying to raise chickens in their backyard and get city ordinances because of COVID <laughs> and they couldn't find eggs and toilet paper at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But you know, that there's there's this component where where people didn't pay attention to natural resources as much. And I think that when you're talking about these 25 to 30, 40 year old individuals that maybe didn't have that upbringing and didn't have that background, but they, they had this urge or this desire to do something that was beneficial to the resource and to the landscape and to conservation. I think that those people need to be educated just as much as what the general non non hunting voting public is right because of the way that things have historically been done for the benefit of the good with a, time proven effort and an honor in a program that we've actually had that that was established that i keep referencing and and so where that's going to take us down the road i think is more and more individuals that have an interest to get into the field but don't fully have overall don't fully have an understanding of the conservation efforts that have been employed over the last 125 years and what that means to the job that they're in and who actually pays the bills yeah, and, and who they're actually regulating to enforce the laws, rules, and regulations for the benefit of the wildlife and the people. And that's not a knock toward the people that are getting into it because I know some very, very smart, educated young people that are getting into this field 
but there's this naivety. That's there's it. This, That's this where it is. Uneducated boots on the ground experience deal. If you didn't do this stuff when you were a kid with your grandpa and your uncle, you didn't go to the farm. You, you didn't go to hunting season with the family. Yep. And now you're getting into this. How do you comprehend when you come up to a hunting camp and there's 12 hunters in that camp that got three deer and an elk hanging there and two of them are non-residents and the rest of them are family members. Yep. And, and how do you, how do you engage in that experience from a, anything other than a law enforcement mentality? Yep. Unless you've been part of that process over the course of the last 20 you or 30 years of your life. It's not possible. You, no. you have to adapt and learn. And so that's where my fear comes is you've got this group that that is naive, right? I, I'm not saying that they don't have a passion for preserving the resource and, and making sure that it, it, you know, is thriving for many generations to come. But you have that naiveness and then you've got this upper you know, executive branch coming down with a lot of negative opinions on the lifestyle. And I, I can't see any other way that that doesn't influence the naive people at that level within, you know, the state agency, because ultimately they don't know any better. They don't know any better. And, and the thing that I can say is, you know, there again, I'm dating myself. I'm 60. I started working in around these, these type of people, um, uh, I was working in a in a taxidermy shop when I was 12 years old, and 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 I was raised around hunting guides and outfitters and trappers and fur harvesters and taxidermists and western artists and game wardens. The game wardens of yesteryear, for the most part, were lifers. Yeah, they were 30, 40 year veterans. Now we have that now, but there's a strong uh, difference now than what it was. Some of the ones that I know now that are in their the their their year 30, 35, and 40, or some even 45 years with this agency, those are the last of a dying breed. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing more and more young game wardens getting into this, and they're really good at what they do, but the but the political pressure, or maybe it's not as in um, gratifying as what they thought it would be, five, six, eight years, ten years into the freaking deal, and they walk away from it. Yeah. It's not a career. It's not a livelihood. It's, it's a, a job. Yeah. And it used to be a life. Game wardens that I knew and some of the ones that are still in, they got 35 or 40 or 50, 45 years in now. Nobody's got 50, but one guy's got 47. I think he's trying to make it to 50. Hmm. I mean, you stop and think 50 years as a game warden. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and, his, and his son uh, is actually my game warden and one of my game wardens. And, uh, and, and, and he's been in uh, going on 20, but, but, that passion, that desire, that enthusiasm is becoming less and less prevalent. Prevalent. I, it's not that I. It's not that it doesn't exist, mm-hmm. but it doesn't exist in the manner that it used to. I know right. one individual that had escalated into a position to an area wildlife manager, one of eighteen in the state, decided to drop it for whatever reasons, go home and be a, a Mr. Mom and, and raise his kids, and uh, and no disrespect to him whatsoever. That's his life, his his choosing. But, but to raise up through the rank and file to be one of 18 in an agency of 1,000 to actually make a difference, I think the political pressures outweighed the benefit that he thought he could get from home. Agreed. That didn't used to happen very damn often. And I'm seeing more and more frequency of that because people are jumping on board because it's cool. It's the quickest thing to do. But they don't hunt and fish, so this isn't complementary to their hunting and fishing practices. And it doesn't take away from their hunting and fishing practices. It's just that they got in, it's a job, and it wasn't maybe as what they hopefully wanted or, or expected out of it. And I think that's a travesty to the resource because people that work in the positions of authority and management and enforcement and boots on the ground experience and dealing with landowners and dealing with the the adapting landscape and the changing, you know, dynamics of what we have to deal with in a state like Colorado, I think solid constant uh consistent interaction is imperative when you start talking about cycles of life for different right. wildlife and i think that's one of the biggest travesties that i see plus the travesty that i see that we get these agenda driven bureaucrats at different levels this isn't this isn't singular to colorado this is all across the country that they come in and they have a different perspective because they learned a different lesson in college or they have a different p- professor or maybe they have a different ideology and they get put into a position 
And whatever was implemented five or eight or 10 years ago now is cast aside, thrown out the window because of the new data, the new science, the new book. Well, they've never done any of the experience themselves. They're just applying chapter seven, paragraph four, right. subsection three in a graph to say, this is what we do. But the guy that has been living there all his life, managing and helping the re renewable resource has that boots on the ground experience to say, well, we had a drought in 2002. We had floods and fire in 2004. We had a disease in 2006. The book didn't tell anybody that. And I think wildlife suffers for the change in adaptable science. It has to be adaptive, like I mentioned, but it can't be knee jerk. Right. It has to be over time and it has to be from experience and it has to be from experts, not just because somebody claims to be an expert because they just came out of college and they got a book and a degree. Hmm. Wild man. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, 10, you know, whatever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam, Addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of, of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in. That said, it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that I have for my own properties or even hunting public land. It doesn't matter. We have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting. So when you and I are after a particular class or quality of deer, usually a mature buck, we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. They can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either Muddy or Stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. It's funny because when you talk about those intricacies of on the ground experience, um, it, I think it's, it's priceless. You know, when, when you're talking about that type of experience on the ground for the management of an area in particular for, for different species, when these outside organizations and groups and, and bureaucrats start to push down on that without understanding not even the base concept, but especially the intricacies of what's happened. You mentioned drought. We talk about disease. Um, we talk about influx of hunting numbers in certain places. All of those things end up being something that, you know, that regional manager or whoever it might be has a, so, has a very, very firm grip on and probably has some great insight. I just often see because of the political pressure, they can't do anything about it. Even if they go out and say, you know, well, here's here's what I'm thinking. Here's my recommendations. The reality is, is that's all they are is purely recommendations. What is eventually set in the actions that are then going to be taken d don't include them very much. Yeah, it, it, it's funny because um, politics and the social dynamics of society combined with in my mind, agendas and and uh, uh, preferential treatment of, of different causes and so forth have led wildlife managers, land resource managers into this, this uh, corner to some degree because they're spending more time doing people stuff than they are wildlife stuff. Yep. They're spending more time on things that that have been brought to the forefront of attention because they are supposedly, well, they are public servants, but what they're told to do for a variety of different reasons, and you can throw out things all you want, but you know, the, the woke landscape, the div diversity, equity, and inclusivity component is, is relevant for human practical, practical purposes. I don't, I don't have an argument with that. And I've gotten into discussions and been part of a lot of these discussions in, intimately myself and, and actually been drug into some things that I unintentionally didn't, didn't have any idea. That's, uh, how, that's how it happens. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 uh, I didn't know I was offending anybody. <laughs> yeah. But what I've said over and over with all due respect, what the hell does that have to do with managing deer populations? Right. What the hell does that have to do with calf and cow recruitment and retention rates? What the hell does that have to do with depredation or disease? 
what the hell does that have to do with hunter opportunity or management objectives for an agency? And so my point is that, and I joke about this, but it's not a joke. It's happening all across the country that politics has played such a significant role because politics can govern state agencies to the point of micromanaging it so much that they're not even doing the majority of the work on the issues that they were hired for and what the what the fee structure actually is. I mean, look at what we're doing in this state. And now somebody might criticize me if they hear this. And at this point in time, it doesn't really matter because it's a fact. These cultural assessments of an agency or these diversity and equity inclusivity programs and these these tools to be able to figure out how to work better amongst each other and 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 what to do holistically to make everybody feel good and have safe spaces and and it, that I don't have a problem if that's what you'd think that you need to do then fine but you're taken away from the management of our wildlife and natural resources while you're doing that yeah because none of that and somebody might argue oh yes it does have to do it no it doesn't no it has to do with the people side of it it doesn't have to do with the wildlife and the natural resource side of it mm-hmm. and if you if you could show me how those sorts of things that have just engulfed so many forms of government and i'm just talking about the specificity of wildlife and conservation it's happened in the department of transportation it's happened yep. in the military it's happened in the youth and human health and services it's happening on everything yeah but i care about the wildlife and the natural resources and i don't think that the deer or the elk gives a rat's ass bit of difference if it's a black game warden or an Asian game warden or a white game warden or if there was three game wardens that came together they don't care about any of it. They're just trying to survive on a daily basis. And it's our job to do that holistically, scientifically, financially, and do it for the benefit of the resource and all the people that are combined with that. Well, we've gotten into so many different programs of game management that are people oriented. Yeah. And so my joke about it is, and it's not a joke, is that wildlife officers, conservation officers, game wardens, whatever you want to call them, are becoming more people cops than they are wildlife cops. Mm-hmm. They're becoming more people managers than they are wildlife managers. And I think that's a travesty. I think it goes in the face of the North American model. I think it goes against science-based wildlife management because out of a 40 hour week, people are spending 10 or 20 hours on all this other stuff that doesn't have anything to do with wildlife. It has to do with the people management of an agency because of agenda driven policies that are brought from the bureaucrats and from the legislators and from elected officials that don't have anything to do with the public trust resource. What a waste of money. Like just just giant waste of money and time. And we we you know it's it's not just Colorado. It's happened everywhere. In fact, when I was coming out of school in Pennsylvania, I've been a lifelong Pennsylvania resident, right? Moved to Mississippi to get my master's degree. Uh, the Pennsylvania Game Commission had a job opening for a wildlife biologist in the state of Pennsylvania. I couldn't apply for the damn job because I didn't have a Pennsylvania driver's license. That was the foundational requirement for me to apply. A lifelong Pennsylvania person who moved to Mississippi for four years so that I could broaden my horizons, get a degree and a master's degree from a different school, trying to come back to be a wildlife manager in my home state, couldn't do it because I didn't have a driver's license. And it was all based on the fact of how they wanted to do it. And the question always came from my side and many others was, don't you want the best person for the job? Like, I don't care if they come from California. If it's the best person for the job, like shouldn't be that that be the person that you hire? Well, you know we've got we've got political things and human resources only want to make us choose from this state. Sure, and it's like, what are you doing? Were, were you unable to just get a? Why couldn't you just get a PA driver's license? Because I didn't live in PA at the time. I lived in Mississippi. I was trying to move back for a job. I see. So I didn't have an opportunity. Nor did anybody else in <clears throat> the other forty nine states of the country. Right. Couldn't do it. Couldn't apply. Couldn't even have an interview to have that opportunity. And it's like at the at the root, going back to what should be done best for the resource, again, whether it's black, white, Asian, whatever, the opportunity should be who is the best for the job, and that's the person that should be doing the job, period. There's no, you know, the, the on paper back and forth and, you know, let's weight this one heavier than another is just, it's crazy in my mind. It's the woke community at this point. But it literally comes down as who is the best person for the job, and that's the person that you should want to be in that position. End of story. And that and that and that sort of selectivity, um, I think, divides and conquers the best person to do the job for the longest, for the best reasons, and and with the most enthusiasm to do it without this high high turnover rate that we're starting yeah. to see 
And we're starting to see such a high turnover rate here. I mean, from 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 very very well educated, thoughtfully minded, smart, intellectual people that that you know they this is what they wanted to do because they thought this would be cool to get into, and they find out just how politically driven it is and how how much of a, a, a rat's nest that it is. And you know, after five or six or eight years, they're like, I, you know, I, I I can't stick here for thirty. Yeah, I got to do something different. Yep. You know, then they go start a landscape business or they're, they're auctioneers or they're, or they're getting into some other, you know, other form of law enforcement, or, or maybe it's some fisheries biologist for some nonprofit or something, but they're not, but this, you know, Colorado parks and wildlife used to be the premier game agency in the country. There's roughly, where there's roughly a thousand individual employees. There's 350 actual certified biologists. I mean, scientists, we've got more biologists and scientists than most states have game agency employees. And, and it used to be the premier. It's still coveted because people think that it'd be cool to be able to, you know, be in those positions. But a lot of those, a lot of those have since retired, stepped out, gone a different direction, decided they didn't want to be in the field, went to the, the state corrections industry, went to the, the Department of Transportation. They can still take their retirement because it's a state employee. They can do something. But they got out of this because it's political. Mm-hmm. Roads and bridges aren't political. People go to work. They run a several, run a backhoe, run a truck, turn around and build a highway. You know, you just do what you're told. Here's the here's the game plan, and this is what you do. In our stuff, no politics have inter intertwined into wildlife man- wildlife and conservation management to the degree that it disrupts people's lifestyle, their psyche about what they're doing and what is right, wrong, or indifferent, and how much of a headache they have to do to be able to go to work because of all this other crap that's thrown into it. Forget about the DEI and 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 all the, the the woke stuff that I talked about. Just because of the fact that an agency is trying to manage for a resource that can be harvested with an offtake, and then there's a political structure of that. We don't want you to kill anything. You shouldn't kill this much. You shouldn't kill you know that species. You the 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 political driven side of things has infiltrated this and other game agencies across the country. Maybe to not to this magnitude, just because of what our upper level political structure is. But it's it's something that needs to be at least cognizant to the people that are paying for the licenses that are hoping to get the benefit that everybody benefits off of. And I say this tongue in cheek, but you know, an elk, for instance, elk tag. Our non-resident elk tags are in you know the the seven or eight hundred dollar range. The resident elk tags are in the $60 range this year. 91% of all elk hunters, straight across the board, guided, unguided, uh, private, public, bull, cow, archery, rifle, muzzleloader, whatever, is a a 9% success, 91% unsuccessful. Where the hell else do you have anybody wanting to turn around and pay 100% of 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 the opportunity to get a 9% return for themselves, Mm -hmm. knowing full well that everybody benefits off of their dollar spent to go to that resource. That's what the, that's what the game managers get. That's what the the hunters get. That's what the, the landowners get. That's what the conservationists get. That's what the anti hunters get, the non hunters, everybody benefits off the hundred percent expenditure, but only 9% are actually going to be successful. And I joke, it's not a joke. How many people do you know that would apply for a license, pay to apply for a license, which is fairly substantial in that in itself, to be drawn in a lottery to say, I got a ticket to go to the grocery store, but there's a 91% chance that I'm going to be unsuccessful when I'm at the grocery store. (laughs) If the grocery store managers and the grocery store people had as much political driven BS to deal with is what our game managers deal with. We wouldn't have anybody managing grocery stores either. No, I, I would assume would I would assume that statistic is not well known. I, I think that, uh, I know myself personally, when I put in for Colorado, like I would have, I would have assumed higher, um, in terms of a, a success rate. I mean, myself personally, like I've been to Colorado to hunt twice and I was successful both times that was with an outfitter. And so like, that's just my perception. It's like yeah. uh, until things start to happen, like, you know, the wolf thing is is recent and like it's it's gotten a lot of attention. And like a lot of people are looking at Colorado, you know, like they looked at us when we liked the John Fetterman yeah. to the sediment. They're like, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, and so things yeah. like that will probably affect the uh, yes, the, the application rate. Yeah, they'll, they'll start to say, oh, maybe 
I don't, you know, maybe it's not so good. Maybe, maybe we'll just start to look, look at somewhere else, you know, but I, yeah, I think, I think they're going to look at somewhere else and they're going to find that Colorado is still going to be pretty good, not great, but pretty good for several years. Mm -hmm. But then you turn around and take out the harvest and the mountain lions, what they're trying to do now, you degrade the, the bear management, like what they're continually trying to do from this objective. And I'm not talking about the agency. I'm talking about the, the anti agenda. You let the wolf population continue to, to grow apex predators. Or they all got to eat. They all got to go to country buffet and they're going to find something yeah. every single day. And uh, if, if that has to deal with mountain lions or bobcats or bears or, or wolves or whatever, five or 10 years down the road, you're going to see an exponential change and the way our ungulate population is managed and you're going to see less hunters in the landscape in some capacity some of that would just be management decisions because of practical uh, you know models and objectives that were that were adhered to or not met <clears throat> uh, and you're going to see less people which means less money less money means less management less management means uh, less need for hunters to participate. And I really believe that the, the overall agenda for the antis is to create this utopia in their mind where predators are the managing body of, of our wildlife populations. Huh. And uh, Yet they'll be the and, first ones to call them bitch when there's a mountain lion in their backyard and the kids are on the swing set. Well, that or or that they can't go skiing because wolves took up occupancy and, and they're dinning in the middle of the ski slope. Exactly. Or the wolverines are stopping the logging process or you can't snowmobile cross country ski or, or or snowshoe across this terrain because now it's been closed because the wolverines have moved in. And, and which is we're, we're talking about introducing wolverines here, which I don't have a real problem with. I talk I'm, I'm looking at the management of wolverines. Uh, right. If you know they, they, they want to do grizzly bears, for Christ's sake. Uh I mean, the, but the bad part about what they're doing is they're undermining the science of those all those experts that I mentioned. Yeah. And, and it's worth noting for whoever listens that I don't mention, every one of our game wardens in this state is a certified wildlife biologist. They are a scientist. That's not necessarily the case in other states on other most levels. Most it's might not. Be in yeah, most yeah. it's not. Here, here they have to have a wildlife degree. Wow. And so – so out of the 118 or so district wildlife managers that we have, those are incorporated into the 350 gotcha. scientists and biologists that we have in that agency that's got a thousand. I mean, that's worth noting because that's not the case everywhere. There has to be some sort of uh, propping up of that system to make sure that that science from the boots on the ground to the top still has some value to the landscape of what they're dealing with. Hmm. I mean, w when you kind of start to look at this from a whole, and, and maybe this is how we pivot into some of these initiative side of things, like obviously there are smart people and the, the Department of Parks and Wildlife, um, this this political side of things. So when some of these initiatives, and, and maybe just for, because I'm naive to it, um, if, if we could talk about the wolf initiative in 2020 briefly, who, who introduced that? How did it even come up to say, hey, we should we should do this. This is a good idea. Animal activist, the they extremist. Did. Yeah, they brought it up. Uh, they, they formulated a group called Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. Uh, they started working through their processes in early to mid-2019, looking for a 2020 election. And uh, and they told a really good story. Uh, they were really good at what they were doing to, to trying to make sure that they brought wolves on the landscape. I think that was a particular uh, want, wish, and desire of this governor and his spouse uh, I think, which is the first gentleman, Marlon Reese. I think it's it's worthy to mention that a lot of the people that were uh, wrapped up into that conversation on wolf introduction were personal associates, friends, or advocates of the governor. Uh, some of them had uh, inner working relationships with this administration. And then they just brought in this plethora of individuals from around the country with outside money to to influence people and say we need wolves on the landscape and you want to hear a wolf howl we can turn colorado into yellowstone and we can Jeez. we can bring back the natural balance and we can do a lot of things and and uh and they deceived a lot of people we lost that election 50.9 to 49.1 percent hmm. and uh and and a lot of that was done because of misinformation misguidance was, uh, and that was a public years. vote dan like that you're saying that was, was a, a general public, public? That was the first time in the country that the public got the chance to vote on introducing a endangered species wow yeah yeah that's crazy and i mean 
obviously false information. It, it just, you know, and, and I guess it's just the naiveness of a lot of this non, um, you know, wildlife minded community, but it's just like, okay, you now just introduced an apex predator into the fold. How do you manage it? And I don't think the management just isn't even on like anywhere in their brain, I guess. Nope. Management is let it be. They do have a 10 J rule installed where they're talking about allowing somebody to, to lethally remove a wolf. I don't say harvest because it's not harvest because hunting is harvest, right? These are conflict resolutions, but uh, they haven't allowed that to happen yet. There's been several individuals that have had livestock losses and uh, guard dog, working dog losses. Uh, they've not been allowed to protect their stock at this point in time. They've been compensated to some degree, even though compensation has been thrown up in the air, depending on who you talk to, um, you know, and, and I don't know everything about wolves like I do on the other stuff, but I sat on the stakeholder advisory group for the wolf management plan. And I was appointed to that. And I was one of the sportsman reps. And I can tell you that the 18 months that I was engaged in there, 16 meetings of which I attended, uh, it was probably one of the most, uh, um, uh, misconstrued opportunities in my opinion to do what was right because you t you could tell that we were guided and we were poked and we were prodded to try to get us to go in specific directions they funneled you right into where they wanted you yeah we wanted to talk about the north american model amongst the ag community and amongst the sporting community and we were pretty much shut down i mean i had to bring documents myself and hand them out to the other members and i think we were allowed in 18 months to talk about the model for a total of 30 minutes Jeez. and and uh and, and that's how the, and that's how management is derived when it comes into big game populations and all other other game populations is is underneath that model. Yeah. They didn't want to acknowledge the model. Why? Because the, it it promotes hunting. It promotes right. agriculture. It it promotes intervention. It promotes you know lethal harvest and management from a variety of different perspectives. And that was not the direction that we were told that we were that we should go. So the lethal harvest component in that model that we created, which was number four in the, in the, in the plan, uh, was subsequently taken out by the commission with no chance of lethal harvest. And then once the 10 J rule was established, uh, that U S fish and wildlife service actually gave Colorado, there's been no action on the 10 J, uh, at least, at least up until today in de December of 2023, they acquired per the vote, Per the ballot itself, which had said that they would reintroduce wolves uh, at the completion of the plan by December 31st of 2023, they did they did release 10 wolves on the ground that they acquired from Oregon. And uh, then there was an injunction to some degree put up. There was a couple court cases filed. One was dismissed. The other one by the Colorado Conservation Alliance is still in court. It's supposed to go to court, I think, May 2nd. And then the agency is likely to figure out if they can it continue to adhere to the management plan and the will of the people to put more wolves on the ground by the end of 2024 and then additional wolves in 25 and 26 until they Jeez. get to 50, all of which would be collared. And then they'd get to a point to where there would be some sort of natural cycle of attrition allowance to that. And unless, unless wolves left and got killed or unless wolves died here for whatever reason, they probably would not release any more wolves until they decided whether that population was going to be somewhat sustainable and self-sustaining or not. I mean, uh, it seems, was, it seems like the, you know, the sad reality is as, as sportsmen for that topic, the voice is just completely, you know, muzzled. I, I would assume, and, and this is just kind of taking assumptions even for other states is uh, a lot of the, the livestock farmers may have the best chance of a voice from a, higher government level down um, because of, you know, the livelihood, right? Again, people easily look at us as sportsmen and saying, well, they just do it because they recreate it. It's, they don't need to do it. They, you know, they just do it in as a hobby. Whereas from a livestock standpoint, it's like, this is their livelihood, right? Wolves eat cattle. That's their livelihood. They lose money. There is some compensation, but eventually it's like, you know, wh where does that go? It, it, it's a conflict that doesn't end necessarily. It's a conflict that doesn't end uh, like what we would like it to be. And, and the thing is, you know, you can't predict what wildlife is going to do. And while I 
bring my anecdotal boots on the ground experience there again i don't have a degree but i've got game wardens that listen to me i've got regulators and administrators and and politicians that listen to me because i've got experience i've got boots on the ground uh although it might be considered anecdotal because i don't have a degree but i've been trapping and i've been working in the same geographical location for the last 40 years and with the business the last 37 years there's his some historical knowledge that goes along with wildlife and game movement and people say oh they were here first no they weren't i trapped this country in in you know the 1970s and 80s and there was no prairie dogs here there was right. no swift fox here that i know because i was here and, you, and not until you people built your houses and made your subdivisions that that stuff eventually move in or it was actually brought in from some location mm -hmm. uh well it's been it's always been that way no it's not it's not always been that way because the, the, the landscape has changed, but it's been that way as far as they're concerned, because when they moved there, whatever was there was already there. So they think it was there since the ice age and yeah. since the beginning of time. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, it's not like that. We see, we see movement in wildlife from my, this is not scientific, but I could tell you that I've caught raccoons on my, on my damage control permits that I'm doing coyote work. I've caught raccoons at 10,000 feet. People say oh, raccoons don't go to 10,000 feet. Well, you should have told these ones because <laughs> regularly I've been catching raccoons at 10,000 feet. Or we catch skunks in different drainages or locations where we've never for 40 years ever caught skunks. Right. And, and for three generations, those ranchers have never seen skunks. Yep. And all of a sudden, skunks are in those locations. They adapt. Either somebody brought them there or they turn around and moved and translocated themselves. Mm -hmm. I've had beavers that we've caught in drainages. To put in other drainages where landowners or parks and wildlife wanted beavers and this guy would call me and he's like hey i got a beaver in my pasture and i'm like you don't have water on your pasture you don't have water on your property and they'd find a dead beaver in a yucca plant 11 miles from the nearest water source because the beaver decided to go across country well if i did that with a beaver you can't tell me they don't do that on their own right how they translocate themselves into other drainages and stuff wildlife changes Wolves are going to do that. Mountain lions are going to do that. There was just a story in one of the local papers that, that they had a collared mountain lion that they tracked for a thousand miles up and down and back and forth. It ended up like 600 miles from where it was originally captured and then went back that direction. And I think that same lion is the one that got killed by another mountain lion because it crossed into somebody's territory. Nobody would know that or be able to document that unless you had a collar on it. Right. But me, myself, see a lot of this stuff where I've caught possums in somebody's attic in pueblo colorado i've been working there for 40 years never seen a possum they say i got the world's largest rat in semi attic and you get over there and it's a flipping possum you think where the hell did he come from <laughs> I mean, did he come in on a cantaloupe truck did he come in on a on a load of pipe did, yeah you know somebody bring him because they caught him in oklahoma and brought him up here i don't know but wildlife changes and adapts on its own and wildlife moves on its own and for anybody to turn around and say this is the way it's going to happen and this is what it's going to do. You could say this is what happened before, but you can't predict what it's going to do 100% of the time. And I think Yellowstone is a prime example of that. Everybody wants to turn around and, and say Yellowstone this and Yellowstone that. Well, I tell you what, where I live is fairly rural, but it ain't Yellowstone. Yeah. And when you get anywhere in the rest of the Colorado, it ain't Yellowstone. Yeah. I, I've seen, um, and I don't know if it's true, but I've seen a graphic floating around talking about Yellowstone in particular with wolf introduction and kind of where elk numbers were and then basically where wolf numbers are and where elk numbers have just dramatically fallen off the map. Is there any, I mean, I, you know, you see these things floating around there. I don't know how accurate they are or where, they're, where their data is coming from, but I mean, logically, it makes sense. You introduce an apex predator where there wasn't one, and wolf not, wolf numbers increase and elk numbers decrease. Yeah, and I think there, I just read an article too that that uh, there was some science came out that there was a study that was done in Yellowstone that kind of that uh, kind mm -hmm. of uh, disputed some of the uh, previous allegations or innuendos or insinuations that maybe it wasn't as big of a, a, a level of utopia as what they had originally thought. It didn't re it didn't repair the repairing areas like they said right. it was going to, or even that some people said that it did. Uh, it did not restore the equal balance like some people had alluded to, and I find that interesting because 
that wasn't driven by anybody other than people that were doing a study on Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't a gender from one side or the other. And uh, now there was a comment in that article that said, but people are impatient and have a tendency to look in, in <laughs> 20 year increments, like it's the timeline of an ice age. And, and I think that, you know, because we live to be 60 or 80 years old, historically, something that happened in the last 20 years, well, that must be gospel. Right. You know, and, and, and it's going to be foresightful that it's going to be catastrophic, catastrophic for the next 20 years. How about let's look in thousand year increments or 20,000 year increments. I mean, nobody here can guess what it's going to do 200 years from now. Right. Or 400 years from now. But everybody keeps saying th that we're in the worst time in history when it comes to climate and wildlife and resources because we're just consuming everything and the and and our our pollution and and the temperature changes and all the stuff that we have to deal with have you looked back during the dust bowl era documents that were created in the 1920s and 30s have you looked back in 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 the average highs or average lows of temperatures in your home state of pennsylvania and then look back in the teens and 20s and see we're not necessarily in the wettest times, the driest times, the coldest times, or the hottest times. There's a lot of that crap that happened 100 years ago or 80 years ago. The fact of the matter is most of us here weren't here then. Right. And we don't recall unless we look at somebody else's documents. But most of us don't look at somebody else's documents because we look at today on TikTok. And we look at today's news flash. Nobody's looking to see what happened 120 years ago or 80 years ago or 60 years ago for that matter. Mm -hmm. I think that we have issues that are changing, but I think I think the landscape has been changing and evolving since the beginning of time. It's just that now we have the ability to think that we can alter it and we can change it and we can stop it and we can promote it in a manner that maybe it just doesn't need it. Maybe yeah. there's going to be some natural cycles of attrition and and I'm all for conservation. I mean, that's my one of my main deals. But I'm talking about conservation in the sense of the last 80 years or 100 years. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen in the next 80 or 100? Yeah. What well, happened I, in the 80 or 100 before that? And I think also take into consideration the the adv the advance of technology over the last 100 years and how we're measuring things and how we're seeing things and how we're reporting on things. I mean, the, the reality is, is, you know, things may not be that different in certain community, you know, ecologically a hundred years ago. It's just the way that we measure it or the way that we're able to monitor it now is so much more advanced that we, we're just being able to pay more attention to it or, or gather more data on it. And, and we're, you made a, a statement, we're being able to pay more attention to it, yeah. but agenda driven policymakers are making a point to take more attention and pay more attention to it because if it goes in their favor, by God, it's a flag they stick up and say, see, I told you so. Yeah. If it goes against what their, their prophecy is, then they go, oh, uh, we're not going to say anything about that right. until somebody else brings it up, and then we have to defend it. And I'm seeing that on our level here. It's like, you know, this is what we did 10 years ago. Well, well, well that study wasn't made uh, 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 you know, personal to us. We, we, we didn't know that that was going on. <laughs> well, maybe you didn't look back far enough. You've only been in office for four years. You've only had your job for two years. You know, the world just didn't start when you started employment. I mean, there was things that went on before you. And just like what I was talking about the, the textbook or people coming in from college and mm -hmm. saying, this is this is how we need to do it. Well, what about the people that have been doing it for 30 years? But they don't have any knowledge about it? I mean, I see, I see stuff that this is hard for people to understand from a East state perspective, but we have land managers on, on the federal side for the Bureau of land management, which is open, open space, public land and, and the forest service and in Colorado, we've got like 11 different national forests, and, uh, and, and, and the other, other states have that, that, that sort of thing as well. Uh, but you know, I've got land managers that have been on the job two or three years and they're telling the public grazing associations i say public because they're using public land to graze their their, their cattle and their sheep on this is the way you need to do it because you're going to change this and you're going to adapt and you're going to modify this and the and the, the leaseholder for that property would be like the fifth generation or the sixth generation guy so the entire family has managed that public land grazing lease for the last 
90 years or whatever. You get a guy out of college, comes in there. He does a ride around on a four-wheeler. He turns around and makes an assessment and says, this is what you need to do. He wasn't there in the spring, <laughs> the winter, the summer, the fall. He wasn't there in two consecutive years. He goes back to his office on the federal side or in Denver, or maybe to the regional office. And he's already questioning what the landowner, the private landowner who is leasing public land and their experience about water and springs and about use and about, about you know, invasive species and native plants and, and, and ta water tables and bugs and, and everything. He's already questioning it, but he hasn't spent enough time on the landscape. And the guy that he got his information from was probably only there two to three years anyway. So just because Big Brother has the authority to be able to do things that we've allowed them to do from a public perspective doesn't mean that they are the almighty and they know every single thing. And I think that that should play into wildlife and natural resource management. And they have public hearings and they have public process. But I don't think that they really listen to the general public as a whole when they sit down and have those conversations. If they did, you wouldn't go to a cattleman's meeting or a wool growers meeting or a sportsman's roundtable meeting and hear all the griping and moaning, groaning, and complaining that they can't mm -hmm. get the federal land managers, let alone the state land managers, to take their perspective into, to, into context because they're going back to some formula and they're going back to some graph and they're going back to some model out of some book that they just got out of college. Yeah. That's going to be our long-term detriment to what we do for Colorado and Western state public land use. But it's not so much that it's the wildlife that's on that land that those federal agencies don't manage because it's left up to state agencies to manage the wildlife on federal property. Mm -hmm. It's a great system. It's just not refined enough, in my mind, to where everything benefits off of it, including the people and the wildlife alike. Well, and the hard part for a lot of this stuff, Dan, is like, it, case in point, the, the, you know, the wolf initiative, obviously passing by a narrow margin. I mean, there's, there's, you know, event after event, action after action in the history of this country. And I know we're a democratic country, we're a democratic process, but the reality is, is not all the time is the majority right. Right. The, the majority gets it wrong a lot of the time. And so in a lot of the big things that the big major actions that this country has taken, you know, it's been a handful or a single person sometimes going against the grain to make a decision for what's right for everybody, because the fact is, is they don't know what's right. Um, and so when we lean on a lot of this democratic process too much in the case of, you know, voting for an initiative like that and we're winning by such a narrow margin, the reality is, is that now has changed the entire landscape of the game for everybody out there when I'm sure there were certain people who were qualified to make the decision on behalf of everybody, even though they may not have agreed with it. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, you ask, you ask 10 people sitting in an intersection, they were all sitting there and saw an accident happen. You're going to get like 12 different explanations sure. of what happened. And some were on their cell phone, some were texting, some were slapping the kid in the back seat. You know, some were watching, you know, the guy, you know, plow into the other guy. Some didn't even pay attention and they were still watching the intersection. I think that's the same thing that you look at when it comes into wildlife and land management use, that you have the same entities, the same agencies, the same people involved and, uh, the, and the same landowners and the same sportsmen and women. Everybody sees things from a different perspective through different glasses and and one of the scariest things, and I, you know, I highlighted this a little bit previously, that if a deer lives, if the average life lifespan of a deer is seven years, and the average lifespan of an elk is eight years, and the average lifespan of a bobcat is five years in the wild, um, and the average lifespan of a land manager is four years, or the average lifespan of a game warden is twelve years, used to be thirty. The average lifespan of a, of a legislator or an administrator, not lifespan, but lifespan on the landscape, right. is 12 years. They're not even getting through two complete lifespans cycles of a deer or three of a bobcat. How the hell do you turn around and say what's right and what's wrong and what's indifferent when you can't look at things more holistically on a large grand scale? Yeah. That's where the science and data comes into play. Yeah. And I'll segue into the mountain lion side of it just as an example, because it's a pretty good segue, I think. But in 1965, mountain lions in the state of Colorado were designated as a big game animal. Prior to that, they were, they were a nuisance. 
They were predatory species. They were killed at will. There was no season. There was roughly 200 of them left in the state of Colorado. And at that time, sportsmen and women decided with the game agency, which was the Colorado Game and Fish Department at the time, decided to allow them to be managed as a big game species. Some to the chagrins of the cattle and the, the wool grower, the livestock industry, because they, they felt that there was a, an extreme need to address mountain lions from a depredation standpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, stop and think. We had, we had less people on the landscape. We had more agriculture producers on the landscape. We had more cattle and more wool, wool growing in the state at that point in time than we, than we do now. Those guys then were concerned, two sec sectors of this conversation, they were concerned about 200 lions on the landscape from a depredation side of things. We have 10 wolves. But now we have 5,000 roughly mountain lions on the landscape because of science-based wildlife management through the through the regulated harvest and management of those game species, we still have 10 wolves. If they were worried about 200 lions back in the day in 1965, when everybody on this call, except for me, wasn't born, <laughs> I was only two. But if they were worried about 200 lions then from a depredation standpoint, but they thought they needed protection enough, protection enough and conservation efforts enough to be deemed a game species, to bring them to a level of 5,000 on the landscape now when the animal rights extremists want to take them away off the landscape now, when they should have been talking about taking them off the landscape then, as far as a harvestable species, they actually made them a harvestable species then when they had 200. Now they want, now we got 5,000, they want to take them off. What the hell are we going to do with wolves 50 years from now? Right. If there's 10 now and it turns out to be let's just say 1500 in 20 years, are they never going to be allowed to be harvested for management? Because if you're really going to manage wildlife in perpetuity for sustainable populations, wouldn't that model that was created in 1965 from almost extinction in the state with 200 to 5,000 now through a regulated management program, wouldn't wolves benefit just as much if you turn around and got to a level to where they were established as a game species? because then somebody would care about them and there would be a method of methodology on how they're managed and where you should offtake and what you should do and how it's going to affect other ungulate populations and human interaction and conflict. I think the hypocrisy that is there from the extremists is so significant that the hyperbole that they throw out needs to be shoved down their throat. Mm -hmm. And on this specific issue for mountain lion ballot initiatives to take mountain lion harvest and bobcat harvest on the landscape, we need to figure out a way to plant our flag in the, stand, uh, in the sand, reference the North American model, pedestalize it, not let it be bastardized, not let it be marginalized, and use things of history as an example to say, this is where we were. And we as sportsmen and conservation-minded individuals and this game agency decided to make these game species from nuisance species to a level to where we actually have more than what we've ever had. The management is actually more thoroughly regulated and highly praised and there's less human animal conflict compared to what there originally was mm -hmm. why wouldn't we think about doing that with wolves when we have this on the landscape that we have to deal with with bobcats and mountain lions now and i think that that brings us to part of the conversation you know part of what we're talking about here today is ballot box biology is not the way to manage wildlife right science is and look what the scientists did in colorado you know what the hell is it 65 years ago 60 years ago, to turn around and say, we need to do this with our mountain lion populations. Why don't we give them the freaking authority to do that with our wolf populations? And now they want to take mountain lions off the landscape as far as a harvestable regulated species? Yeah. Sportsmen and women are the one that provided all of that, and sportsmen and women should be the ones that are praised for that. It's a complete undermining of the department in which it holds the responsibility to manage these resources. I mean, the reality is, is these extremists and, and governor and, and everybody bringing that down and forcing, you know, those uh, different twists and turns on the actual facts of it to get things pushed through on a ballot initiative ultimately are just completely ignoring the agency that was put in place to be responsible to manage this stuff. It's, it's mind blowing. It, it, the reality is, is the fact that these agencies don't have the ability to literally step in and say, whoa, 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 with respect, you're the governor or whoever you are. The reality is, is 
we're scientists. We know better about this stuff than you do. This this can't happen this way. But instead, it gets blown right by, put onto a ballot, and then it's open to the public, which frankly doesn't know any better. Not only do, do, do they not know any better, they're not they're not educated enough. I don't want to say stupid because they're not stupid. They're not educated enough no. to know any better. No, They're not educated enough to not take the gospel of animal rights extremists and say, well, I guess we don't have any mountain lions left and maybe we shouldn't have any harvest of anything. Uh, they're not smart enough to, to, to be able to differentiate between the rights and the wrongs and the fallacies and facts because it's not in their wheelhouse. If you don't, if you don't pay attention to something, how are you going to know that that's right, wrong, or indifferent? And if it's not in their wheelhouse, it makes them ignorant. It doesn't make them stupid. I say they're not smart enough. They're not smart enough because that hasn't been brought to their attention until they get a chance to go to the ballot, go to the poll, turn around and check a box because there was a no or a yes on there. And I wanted this or I wanted that. Hmm. And I think that that's a bad way to do wildlife management. I think it's a bad way to do conservation management. Everybody's got an opinion about every other thing on the planet. But if, but if, it, if it doesn't affect them, if they have no knowledge about that topic or that subject, how in the hell do we expect them to make decisions unless it adversely affects them? You want to talk about taxes? Yeah, that affects everybody. Yep. You want to talk about abortion? That probably affects everybody in some capacity because of just religious beliefs or whatever. But that's where they've got to the emotional side on wildlife is they're trying to say the emotional social science side of things is people don't want you to kill anything for that purpose. Right. How do you know that? And if you don't know what the purpose is, how do you know what box to check when you go to the ballot? Hmm. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Rack Hub. Well, dude, sheds are starting to hit the ground. Yeah, and although we usually don't find many of them, we've done pretty well this season so far. I would say for just, you know, a handful of walks, we've got a pile of sheds to show for it. For, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, if shed season would end today, I think it was pretty successful. So this year, we're partnering with Rack Hub. It's an antler mounting system for your sheds. Yeah, and obviously, people have watched our podcast. We've got this massive pile of sheds that are on the table at all times. But you guys took the time to set up Wide Boy Shed on the R1, which is a really cool way to now have that thing right off to my left-hand side during the podcast. So some of these sheds just call for a little bit more appreciation, I guess. So rather than being up on a pile on the table, you know, we're going to mount them on the wall and, and they look awesome. So Yeah. And so if anybody wants to try Rack Hub, you can use the code HUNTER10, H-U-N-T-R-1-0 at rackhub.com to get 10% off your order. Use Rack Hub to make the most of your shed season. Yeah, I, it's it's a hard thing to to understand, and it's been like that for a long time. And the fact that you know you look, and this is where I go back to you know people often pointing fingers at the at the wrong people. In, in perfect case in point, you know there'll be many sportsmen that point the finger at at Colorado's you know Department of Parks and Wildlife. The reality is, is like the people voted on it; it passed. Like that, there there's nothing. Like maybe they could have intervened more. Maybe they could have tried to put better educational. The reality is, is people are going to do what they want to do. And when it's put to the mass public, most of the times the mass public gets it wrong. When it comes into things like that, especially when you drive emotion and when you give uh, the false information and you misinform and the people don't get a chance to be educated. If Colorado Parks and Wildlife had the ability, just as any game agency, to turn around and come out and go, we don't support this because the science would not be correct. We don't support this because it would be wrong for wildlife. Or we do support this because yeah. it would be right for wildlife. If they were allowed to do that, make a big difference when it came to the decision-making process. But the antis know, specifically in this state and others, that those agencies aren't going to be allowed to talk. They're not going to be allowed to give an opinion. They can't say yes or no. They can't even say we are neutral because that's classified as an opinion. They say that we have no opinion, <laughs> which is absolute 100% bullshit because everybody has an opinion and every agency has an opinion and every form of government has an opinion, especially with the people at the top. What you're saying is that you've been told to do that because your bosses say that you have no opinion. I find that to be a disgrace. I yes. find that to be offensive. And I think that the sportsmen and women, the conservation minded individuals in this country need to stand up. And how do you do that? Either through monetary contributions to our cause at this specific level, because we'll get into why this should have 
should interest of anybody, but then vote and educate your neighbors and educate your peers and your coworkers and your congregation. And everybody, everybody needs to know why you should do or not do something when it comes to wildlife and wildlife management. Because if we're not going to tell the story and the game agencies can't tell the story, Mm -hmm. who's the general public going to listen to? The story from the antis that are turning around and trying to take it away and from the the agenda driven politicians and the animal rights extremists that are trying to make sure that their message gets across because they know they have the clout they have the pull and they can muzzle people that have the science on their side well and the hard part for and i won't speak speak for every state but like states that i know that we're heavily involved in or, or have intimate knowledge on you you mentioned ohio pennsylvania the reality is is a lot of times these you know, maybe not something as serious as this, but hot topics, hot issues come up and the game commission or the DNR or whatever will ho- hold open mics and they'll have these meetings and stuff. The reality that most of us sportsmen know is the moment we walk into that building, the decision's already been made. We have no say in it. There is no voting power. It's up to the commission and it's up or to the legislature, period. There is no public voting. Like we can scream into the mic all we want. They already made the decision. They don't care what we say. And when that happens over and over and over and over again, eventually it's like, shit, I don't matter anyways. So it's hard to to try to think about taking a stand besides having groups like what you guys are doing out there on the front lines lobbying from a sportsman side. You know, it's it's discouraging. Well, when it happens, like at the very highest level of political office, like, you know, they're they're telling that like Biden had the most votes of all time ever. And it's like, how many people are out there being like, Really? Yeah. Like, you know, it's just, so that's, that's the, the highest example of like uh, a disbelief in, in that what we're getting told is actually, uh, you know, the belief or the opinion of the American people. It's just, yeah. What, what do you do with that? You say that that's when you just become, you know, you, you walk away from the job or you, you know, you decide you're like, well, I'm just going to, what, what can we do? Yeah. What, what, what power do we have to influence that at all? I guess I'm just going to go do my best. And try to stay out of the limelight until I die, and then it's everybody else's problem to deal with. I mean, that's that's the feeling that it inspires, right? Yeah. Well, and 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 to give you a little bit of historical background, you know, we, we lost spring bear hunting in 1992 with with hounds and bait, so we can hunt spot and stalk in the fall. Uh, we we lost the trapping, as I mentioned, in 1996. They brought wolves in in 2020. There was a little bit of a gap in there, just because there was some. There was some political structuring that was taking place that actually got us to where we're at today and put us in such a precarious position from 2020 or 2000 until 2020 and 2024. Uh, it's just a lot of posturing and maneuvering and the, and the state grew. I've been involved heavily since 2007. I was involved on the periphery before that. I was critical in assessing a lot of the things that happened before my involvement and I took heed to uh, some of the inefficiencies and ineffectiveness that I saw back in the nineties and tried to employ that in, in, in the some cast c- capacity, you know, since 2007. So when we formulated CRWM in 2017, we did that in preparation for what we knew was likely going to happen in the next gubernatorial election. And then as the prime candidate started to surface, you started to see some of the writing on the wall and you figured you better get your crap together because somebody's going to turn around and try to, you know, make some significant movement. The reason I bring that up for, for, for just a historical optics is, uh, in 2019, these individuals came to the Colorado parks and wildlife commission with the governor's appointed commissioners. I want to say, and we were told that we would lose, the fur bearing harvest and trapping of bobcats with cages, nonetheless, back in 2019. And our group specifically rallied the troops and we put 350 people in a parks and wildlife game commission meeting. And we, we took the governor's commissioners and got an 11 to zero favorable vote on our side. In 2020, during COVID, the same bastards came back to do it again through the parks and wildlife commission because the governor put a couple more commissioners on there that maybe would be more favorable. Again, with the right fight during COVID, we beat them 11 to zero with the governor's commission appointments. They came back in 2021 during the second year of COVID. And because they saw that they were probably up against insurmountable odds, they withdrew their petition two weeks before the meeting 
that we had already built our armament up and we were turning around and going to pack the, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the commission meeting again. So they withdrew the first, first year, 11 to zero, second year, 11 to zero, third year, they withdrew the fourth year in 2022, first day of the legislative session, they ran a bill to ban the harvest of mountain lions and bobcats. We had two weeks to prepare for the, for, for the hearing. We outreached our asses off and we called every single person we could possibly get. We weren't structured to where we are now, even though we were in the process of building that up, but we had two years of COVID to have to deal with. So it was kind of hard to have any public meetings right? unless you were wearing a mask or could put five people in a room and everybody else had to stand outside and freeze their asses off. Well, at that hearing, four below zero outside during the backside of COVID where people still had to wear a mask into the building, we put 370 some odd people, four below zero on the steps of the Capitol, did a rally, went inside. And with this general assembly, this legislature that we were told that we would lose at because of the makeup of the legislature, that we are highly outnumbered, Democrat to Republican, highly outnumbered. We won four to one. We were told we would lose four to one. We won four to one, took a little bit of a break went through commission stuff, very little legislative stuff, except for some gun and a few uh, public land issues during the 23 legislative session. And in September of 23, they decided to take whatever efforts they had built up with this governor's spouse's support and with other groups, they dropped the initiative, which was eventually initiative 91. And that was to let the voters vote on this coming November the banning of the harvest of mountain lions, bobcats, and the red herring on there is lynx because it says lynx, but you can't harvest lynx in the lower 48 anyway. But they, they said in their public testimony through the title board that we challenged that the reason that we put lynx on there is because in case lynx ever get delisted, we never want them to be harvested in the state of Colorado. So, so they're, so, already, they're already kicking that down the road. So Dan, how, how are they obviously through that time frame, like, you know, you guys have continued to prove, um, you know, and, and prevent passing of these things. How are they now all of a sudden able to say, well, let's just get it to a public ballot initiative? Like, you know, they did, it sounded like commissioners at first, then it went commissioners, then it went legislature, and now it's purely, ba like, explain to us how that is even possible from a structure standpoint. 26 states allow ballot initiatives by public process. And that's one reason why this is connected throughout the country in some capacity, because essentially, I mean, this is this is a, a fictitious statement here. But if I didn't want anybody to own pit bulls in the state of Colorado, I could do a public ballot initiative to be able to do that and go through the title board. And if I could get the signatures to get it on the ballot, then we could turn around and vote on that. Wow. If I didn't want Pennsylvanians to come hunt here, I could turn around and say, I'm going to write a title and I'm going to go through the title board and I'm going to do the proper process and procedure. And once the title board gives me the title and it says the language of the specific ballot measure, I go out and get signatures and I say, I don't want Pennsylvanians to be able to come hunt in Colorado ever again till the end of time. People would vote on that and we would screw Pennsylvanians from being able to do that. Now, there would probably be lawsuits and there sure. would be you know, litigation in some capacity. If I wanted people... I mean, the, the, the stupidity of this, if I could get the language and go through the title board, I could say everybody on Sunday in the, in the state of Colorado has to have pink hair or it's a misdemeanor. If you could get that through the title board and get signatures, you could put it on the ballot. And how so difficult really is easy. the title board when you talk about that? So the, so the title board is in within the Secretary of State's office, and all the title board does is set the title of the measure. They can't change the language of the measure. We can't alter or change or recommend the language of the measure. We can only alter or change the title, which is the title of the ballot initiative itself. Mm -hmm. So in this case, when they came out initially, they came out with a prohibiting, prohibiting trophy hunting trophy hunting of mountain lions, bobcats, and lynx. Okay, well, the definition of trophy hunting, and this is where your listeners need to pay special attention, and I'll get to this, is trophy hunting in the measure. It referenced it in the title, but trophy hunting in the measure, the definition is to intentionally kill, wound, stalk, 
entrap, or pursue a mountain lion, bobcat, or a lynx. Intentionally kill, wound, stalk, pursue, or kill a mountain lion, bobcat, or a lynx. If if you if you really break that down, that's hunting. Yeah, that's hunting. Intentionally pursuing. Yeah, you're it doesn't say on. anything about trophy class. It doesn't say anything about mature animal. It doesn't think it say anything about antlers and meat and harvest and, and hide. It just talks about intentionally killing, wounding, stalking, pursuing, or entrapping a mountain lion, bobcat, or lynx. So we can't change that language. What we did change is where it says trophy hunting in, in the, the title language itself, where it says now it just says hunting. That's more favorable to us because trying to get people to understand what is trophy hunting. Right. Unless they met, unless they read the measure, which is in the blue book, separate from the ballot itself. Unless they read the measure, they would think, "Well, goddamn, I don't, I don't want trophy." Yeah, hunting. I don't want trophy hunting. Most non-public to, are against trophy hunting in their minds. Yeah. You know, I don't want you to go out and kill something, take the head off, and then walk away from yeah. it. Trophy hunting, and the and the and the thing is, this is where your people need to pay attention. All of us need to pay attention from sportsmen and women across the country. This would be the first time through any game management agency that there would be a declaration, statutory declaration made that defines trophy hunting. And the way they define it in this measure is just as I said, intentionally killing, wounding, stalking, and pursuing or entrapping a mountain lion or a bobcat or a lynx. If that's statutory, and that can be set as a precedent in this state, other states, or across the country. That's hunting. That's hunting. Period. That's that's the pink elephant in the room here. It's not about mountain lions or bobcats. You could take you could take elk, you could put bighorn sheep, you could put mountain goats, you could put mallard ducks. Take those out. And the statutory definition have, has already been established about what trophy hunting is because there's not a component of, of, you know, stature and maturity and, and what you're doing. It's the fact that you're doing it. Hmm. And if they, if we allow them to misguide and misinform the general public here and a precedent is set to where somebody else wants to reference federally or otherwise, this is what they did in California or Colorado, which is California now. <laughs> I mean, it's become more Californicated. But if they want to turn around and do that, people need to pay particular attention. Tris Zornio with the Colorado Sun last year and last fall in one of her headlines said, why are bighorn sheep any different than mountain lion? Hmm. They're already setting the table to where if they're accomplishing this, they're yeah. moving to the next level. Why are we allowing people to kill the state animal, bighorn sheep? Well, the Bighorn Sheep Society, Rocky Mountain Bighorn, the Wild Sheep Foundation came out and went, what? Wait, wait, wait. We thought this was a mountain lion deal. Now they're talking about bighorn sheep? No, they're talking about it all, but they know they can't get it all at once. But they can go in incremental steps and take the low-hanging fruit of bobcats and mountain lions because supposedly we're killing all the bobcats and we're taking them overseas so the Chinese can make coats, which then remarkably they bring it back to us to sell. <laughs> Our bobcat populations are at an all-time high nationwide. Statistics indicate 1.2 to 1.4 million bobcats. In Colorado alone, they save somewhere between twelve and 20,000. We're roughly taking about 10% of that off, take off. With mountain lions, we've got roughly 5,000 mountain lions, 2,500 licenses sold last year, 486 lions that were, that were harvested, not necessarily killed because the killed component goes into depredation issues and human health and safety and, and road kills. I'm just talking about harvested mountain lions. Right. But in any event, it's still less than the 22% threshold of an offtake of what would be a harvest, would be a sustainable harvest. The, the facts and the data and the science back up everything. But when you're talking to the general public, you know, we've been talking, uh, what, an hour and a half? Two hours. I don't have time. To, who's going <laughs> to listen to an hour and a half conversation talking about all the nuances, nuances and caveats of wildlife management when they're going to the ballot and to check a box? Right. That's why it was so important for us to get the title language switched and say, this doesn't have squat to do with trophy hunting. This is hunting. And we feel that we have a better chance to convince the general public, the uneducated general public, about this is a hunting ban. It's not a trophy hunting ban. And and people need to pay attention. That's why we're asking for, for money to help us educate and advertise the target audience of that middle of the road crowd. We know that most of the hunters are going to support us and most of the anti-hunters are going to support the other side. It's the what we need to do is be able to have yeah. enough money to tell the target audience, that middle of the road crowd, which we classify as 18 to 34 or 44 years old, 
25 miles east or west of the I-25 corridor from El Paso County to Fort Collins. I mean, that's where the bulk of our population is. We've got 5.9 million people in the state. Roughly 1 million people live outside of that corridor and 4.9 million people live inside of that corridor. And roughly 3.5 million people of those are registered voters. That's the people that we need to talk to. Mm -hmm. And we can't afford to do that when we are in the minority of turning around and trying to talk about science and facts and data and statistics. You got 30 seconds at the most to be able to get those people to understand why is this wrong? Why does this benefit you if it, if it doesn't happen and what does it do to you detrimentally if it does happen? It is, got it 30 is, seconds or less. It is pretty wild that that's like the, that's the, uh, the weight of the consideration is given to like a, the, a non hunting public who for the most part, like it, it has no effect or impact on like, it, you know, that's why they don't think about it. It's like, it almost seems like for a decision like that, or for, you know, frankly for a lot of decisions, it's like, you would almost want to see somebody registered as a hunter or as an anti-hunter and then, and then have a vote, you know, and there's obviously, you know, reasons for or against on either side. It's just, it blows my mind that it's like, it, that it is the non-hunting community that ultimately makes the decision, you know, for, <laughs> and, and for most states it's going to be that way too, as I was explaining for when, sure. you were, when you were off that I mean, 26 states have this, have this process available to them. Uh, well, and, and it's almost and, just like it, it, it doesn't seem fair, which I, I realize life isn't, but it's like it's, it's a pretty easy argument to say like, hey, if you don't care to begin with, should we kill him or not? And then I can just throw a picture of a dead animal or something, you know, something that's uh, hard to see or, or it's easy for me to say, yeah, I don't want I don't want that. Like, it, man, it's a uh, seems like we've got a much bigger battle on our hands to say, well, he, well, here's why. Take the time to listen and educate. And it's like, and you lost him. <laughs> That's that's and that's the, the you know I sit I sit on I sit on the Colorado Wildlife Council as the chair and the Wildlife Council is one of three in the country, and and the the council's uh, money comes from a dollar fifty off of each hunting and fishing license yep. and it goes into this pool and it's our education campaign to show the benefits of hunting and fishing. Now that's different than what we're doing on on the campaign side of it, mm -hmm. but they do cross over. I mean without me getting into a conflict of interest, I'm not advocating for the council to support anything other than what the council's mission and the objectives is because like the council, we work underneath the umbrella of the guise of Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So we have to take somewhat of a level of neutrality ourselves when it comes to ballot initiatives and legislation and so forth. But we have to be able to turn around and show the benefits of hunting and fishing. Right. The, the attention span of the general public is about 0.7 seconds right now. Sure. And I'm not an internet guru, but I know enough that's coming from our contractors that are supplying our recommendations for our advertising campaigns. 0.7 seconds is the attention span. You need 1.7 seconds, which is what the, the experts tell us, to be able to have some sort of recollection of what they previously saw. But that 1.7 seconds needs to be magnified by seven times to be able to get them to recognize the relevancy of what they saw and what it addressed. So that means exposure and saturation to the target audience. I don't care whether you're talking about hunting. I don't care whether you're talking about football. I don't care whether you, I don't care what it is. What, you know, why do you think Super Bowl ads that cost $7 million run for 30 seconds and they constantly browbeat you over and over and over. And then they'll do another one for 30 seconds. Then they'll do another one for 30 seconds. And you turn around and see them in short spurts after that in seven to 15 second social media spots and then another 15 or 30 second commercials because of the exposure and saturation. That's on a product that you're trying to sell. It's not an ideology that you're trying to convince people right. about the benefits of hunting and fishing and that, oh, our intent is actually to maybe try to kill something, even though 91% of elk hunters are going to be unsuccessful. We want you to support this measure and we want you to understand how that benefits you if you oppose it or the other other side is trying to say this is how this benefits you if you support it. And that's the hurdle that we have, not just in Colorado, but in many, many other states. And we've got other ballot initiatives that are going on here this year that are more uh, bullet pointed, more concise to municipality votes, but could affect a state process. There's a fur ban in, in Denver this year where it'd be illegal to sell fur. But what people don't read is they just see the fur. I don't want anybody to wear a fur coat. I don't think you should have a fur coat. It also includes beaver felt cowboy hats. 
it, you won't be able to buy or sell a cowboy hat in Denver with the Denver Stock Show. I mean, it's the West for Christ's sake. Sorry, Nick. I mean, you won't be able to sell yeah, yeah, yeah. fly fishing hats. lures that have wild fur on them. You won't be able to do fly tying stuff. The Native American culture won't be able to, the indigenous cultures won't be able to do things at the Denver Indian powwow, the March powwow, or the Denver, Denver Indian market. You won't read that part of it. They who just are read the fur people band, coming up with this stuff? It's just the extremists that are introducing it's, this, and then that's it's the extremists, and they find the best opportunity, which Colorado, in their minds, is one of the best. There's a slaughterhouse ban initiative, a ballot initiative for the city of Denver to vote on. There's one lamb slaughterhouse has been there since the early 1900s. They want to kick it out and make sure that no slaughterhouses ever come into Denver again. Okay, so now they want to decide what we eat what we wear, what we utilize, what we recreate with, how we manage our wildlife. It's all encompassing to the point to where some of this stuff goes on around the country, specifically in the East, mostly in the West. It's easier to try to get across to people in the West because of the population densities that we have. I mean, you, you have to have less people to make more of a decision. And, but people need to pay attention. It's not, it's not a one-off about Colorado guys. It's, it's about, this extremist mentality and agenda that they see an opening with political driven mentalities that are created by legislative elections. And they put the right people at the right time at the right place to make the wrong decisions on behalf of everybody. And pretty soon people are standing around going, when the hell did they do that? So what, did, what, what, what do you mean can't we buy lamb chops in a cowboy hat? So Dan, here, here's, <laughs> here's kind of the loaded question. And I think, you know, money obviously is a big part of this answer, but like, when do we stop just being a defensive organization? When do we start going on the offense and and saying, "Man, let's let's start pushing shit back down their throat. Let's get in front of them." Because right now it's just defense, defense, defense. I feel like, you know, if anything, we want to we want to make progressive changes and stuff. How do we flip the script? How do we start going on the offense on this stuff? Well, we've attempted to try to do that, but we're 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 being dealt so many things thrown at the wall that fundraising itself is a problem. And I'm not just talking about Colorado. I mean, New Mexico's got stuff going on. Arizona's got stuff going on. Nevada's got stuff. Utah. I mean, all the Eastern States look at Washington and Oregon and California for crying out loud. I mean, it, it's just what's going on there is, is a, is as significant as what's going on here. It probably doesn't get as much publicity because it, it's not as a uh, uh, scripted as what it has been here. I mean, our governor and our first gentleman have, have led the charge on a lot of this, but to, to be on the offense, you either have to have a really, really, really good defense, but you can't run defense and offense at the same time. And I joke, I like sports. I'm not that good at it. I used to play ball when I was a kid, but you know, that's about the extent of it. I used to ride bulls and I was good until I grew and, you know, but you can't put defense and offense on the, on the field at the same time. Right. You know, they, they don't have to because they're always on the offense and we're always on the defense because we're trying to stop them from doing other shit. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the thing that you, if you can yeah. visualize that and conceptualize that to, to the average person, yeah. they can understand football. Yep. They go, it's why aren't you doing this? Because we're on the field all yeah, the time doing can't, this. We can't get we're, off the field on defense. It's like, it's in the yeah. very nature of the position. It's cause like we want something which is hunting and they want nothing. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> well, I mean the <laughs> only offensive yeah. things that I've seen are like um, in a lot of States putting, hunting as a right right because in most states it's not it's a privilege right so there are certain states that have gone through and pushed through initiatives of hunting as a right that's the only real offense sure. that i've seen and which states that, which states are those uh arkansas well, there's, I think, there's, did it recently well there's about 25 states that have got the right to hunt and fish in some capacity yeah mm -hmm. but but look at the look at the five or six years prior to those states they weren't dealing with anti-initiatives most no. generally. No. They were, I mean, Kansas, for instance, and I know the guy that ran the Kansas legislation for the right to hunt and fish there. And uh, it took them six years and they didn't have any opposition. It just took them six years through different, you know, scheduling and, and process and procedure to get it. And I think it passed in the, in the 90 percentile or something, but they couldn't even get it to that point for a six year deal. If we did it here and we did it legislatively, it would have no freaking teeth whatsoever. If we do it, we need to do a constitutional amendment. And to do a constitutional amendment, you're probably looking at three to four times the amount of money than if you did something statutorily. Wow. So now you're probably looking at maybe 10 to $12 million to try to do a constitutional amendment, which at that point you need 
2% of your signature signatures that you gather from each of the 35 Senate districts throughout the state. I mean, that's it's substantially higher. And then I think the threshold now is you'd have to have 55% of the, of the population to vote, to be able to enact a constitutional amendment. Uh, well, the money, the process, the time, the procedure. And the extremists the know it. They know it. That's they, why they, they can. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the number of people seems like the biggest hurdle there. Like, you know, uh, between all the sheep hunters in, you know, in Colorado, like, yeah, 10 to 12 million sounds pretty doable, right? Like, you know, it's more than 55% of the general population you'd have to, you know, to enact something like that seems like the, the yeah. bigger hurdle, but, frankly. But, but see, there, there was, there was, and I just got off a call yesterday um, with four different agricultural organizations and a couple individuals that wanted to try to reverse proposition 114 which was the wolf initiative mm -hmm. and and they said we need to do this this is now or never we got to do it this year and we're trying to talk them off a cliff because we're like we got three other ballot initiatives that are coming at us that we're trying to defeat yeah the financial resources and the attention of our communities agriculture and sportsman wise is not good enough and it hasn't been proven to be good enough to turn around and be on the field at the same time on right. offense and defense and so we think that we talked them off a cliff, which we hope that we did, because if that's the direction they want to go, we're pretty convinced that that's probably going to take all of our resources that, that will be divided amongst four different things, as opposed to one different cause with three different things. We believe that the that we believe, and based upon polls, that the money we've raised, which has been substantial, can help message about the slaughterhouse deal, even though we're not putting money into it, the ag community is, mm -hmm. can help message about the fur ban, even though we're gonna put a very minimal amount of money into it because the Natural Fibers Alliance and other groups are going to. I mean, the cowboy industry and the fur, the fly fishing industry is gonna come out wholeheartedly against that. Mm -hmm. And then and then what we're doing on the Bobcat and the Lion deal, we can concentrate our efforts and our money on that without having to worry about turning around and trying to advocate for reversing what the public just voted for, that they just put wolves on the ground, that everybody's jumping up and down. And I'm saying not everybody, but 51% of the people are. So to be on offense and defense at the same time is not only what we think an ill-advised move, it's probably, it probably would create such havoc that we would lose the slaughterhouse deal, lose the fur ban, lose the bobcat and the lion deal, and not regain any any corrections on the wolf deal too. So then we'd have four losses. And at that point, I'm really convinced that you could just write Colorado and Colorado's wildlife management off. Do you think it's possible to have a group like yours on the, on the field ground level on the defense and have a overarching national entity begin attacks on the offense simultaneously? Uh, conceptually. Yes. Uh, realistically, no. And I say that because that's what I would like to see. And that's what we've talked about, but there's been more talk than there has been action. You know, the American wildlife conservation partnership, which is the multiple number of groups that, that provide federal input, you know, Rocky mountain elk and the whitetail associations mm -hmm. and Turkey and everybody, they, they, they have this coalition built in Washington. They talk about federal issues. They don't talk about state issues. And, and which to, seems to crazy do... because at the resource level for what we're talking yeah. about game and wildlife, it's managed at the state level, not at the federal yeah. level. And that's, and that's, that's the, the, the breaking point. That's the weak point in our chain. Uh, because all those organizations that I mentioned who are great, who support the cause, sure. who do the habitat and the conservation, uh, they'll agree if they don't th then i haven't talked to them but the ones that i've talked to and the ones that i'm working with they'll agree that when they were created they were not created for today right they were created for habitat and wildlife conservation not necessarily the fight the fight has has exceeded the efforts in the cause on the landscape They've done so much of the yeoman's work historically for the last 25, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, whenever they were each formulated, that today they're not prepared for right. the fight. So they're on the defense just as much. They are 501c3s, 
So they are limited in substantial limited. capacity of what they can do for campaigns, for advocacy work. It's not impossible for them to, but they don't get to do it in the manner that a C4 or a PAC or anything else that was ever created. It's limiting their efforts, which is now, to my mind and to our minds, they see that it's it's somewhat damaging their ability to sustain their own model because without what we're talking about on the fight, what good is it to turn around and have all of the other stuff out there? And I'm sure. not knocking Rocky Mountain Elk because they're a giant contributing factor to this. They're great partners on our landscape in Colorado. We are part of the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Partnership that I mentioned. They are a player on that. The state guys and the, and the national guys. However, would the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation survive if hunting wasn't here? I think it would. Because they, they they talk about elk conservation. Now, hunting is a component of that. But elk conservation would still survive in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Because they're not a hunting organization. They're a conservation organization. We are not an organization in the sense that we're doing any habitat work. We're not doing any species conservation work. Right. Our mission is to promote and enhance, defend the North American model of wildlife conservation and responsible wildlife management. That doesn't say anything about hunting, but it but it, but it gives the the general conception that we're supporting hunting because of the North American model. Mm -hmm. But we don't do fence pulling, we don't do studies, we don't do habitat modification and programs, and 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 you know we don't have contracts with with government agencies. We're we're just trying to do the fight. Right. Here's I'm not saying the other ones are wrong, but we need to figure out a way another model to enhance what those other organizations can do for the future in the fight or as the animal rights community continues to build and get stronger and broader and cast their net out just from the demographics of the public, those other organizations bigger, better figure out a way that, that conservation is the number one issue, but you better figure out a way to turn around and have some armament built up behind you to fight because when sportsmen and women are gone at whatever level, who's going to do your fighting for you. Here's like a, uh, I don't know how to word this question, but like, I guess if not for hunting and sportsmanship, what is the point of conservation of game animals? Like, what, it, 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 did, does that make sense? It's like, it, I would look at that and say, well, they're, they're here for our consumption in, in a form of, I mean, primarily hunting. What's the subsidiary use? It's emotional. Looking at them? It's emotional, it's emotional. ties. Yeah. yeah, people love seeing elk. They have no, you know, intention of ever shooting an elk. They just love seeing them. It's wildlife viewing. Wildlife viewing is probably as big, if not bigger, than hunting in this country. Wow. Listen, listen to Shane Mahoney with with Conservation Visions. You know, the, one of the founders of the model itself, uh, along with Valerius Geist, and, and and Shane and I have been fortunate enough to strike a friendship up and, and and communicate back and forth and spend some time in each other's company and listen to what he says about whether you just like to watch wildlife and just knowing that it's there. That's what the general public mm. perceives yeah. about wildlife and conservation. Them going to the, excuse me, I got the hiccups now. Them going to the park and seeing a deer in the park, the city park, the county park, an open space park. To them, that's good enough because they saw wildlife conservation. Them going up I-70 outside of Denver, going to Idaho Springs and seeing bighorn sheep sit on the side of the road and lick the salt off the highway is their experience of wildlife, just knowing that it's there. They don't know that that the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Society is selling a tag, one tag, this last conservation effort in the Wild Sheep Foundation, they sold one bighorn sheep tag for $600,000 to be able to hunt a Colorado bighorn sheep. But that money goes to conservation. Most people driving up I-70 don't know where that money comes from and how it's funded. Right. They don't know the structure of the sheep management side, but they know that wildlife is there. And to them, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. To us, without the hunting, we can't provide the conservation resources. And so it's this, it's this circular mom moment in time, I think, that, we, you know, me talking about these other conservation groups, guys, while, while we, we are relying on them to help message and potentially fund our efforts on these initiatives, there has to be something to where all of those groups combined historically from now moving forward start talking to the general freaking public yeah they're talking to their membership 
How many times have you seen the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation? I'm picking on them because that's most prominent, or the National Wild Turkey Federation or the Wild Sheep Foundation. Do a damn commercial, a public messaging commercial on network television to the general freaking public. They don't. Humane Society does. ASPCA does. They turn around and say, give us money, $19 a month, and we'll fix the whole world's problems when it comes to wildlife and domestic animals. And why don't we? Because we haven't had to, because we've had this structure available where we as sportsmen pay into the system. We pay for the management. Those organizations take our membership, enhance and promote conservation efforts, but we don't educate the general public who's going to make all the decisions at the ballot. We don't educate the legislators on a broad level. We might talk to them in their office and we might have some sort of coalition or some sort of lobbying effort behind the scenes. We don't do shit to the general public. Nothing. Why? Because we're not selling a product. Mm -hmm. We're selling a concept. But I tell you what, the animal rights groups are selling a concept too, and they're they're trying to figure out ways to degrade and erode that conservation effort before we even get to a ballot initiative, before we even go to the poll, because they're advertising on national television at every single freaking level that you can possibly get. And our organizations have not done that because they haven't had a need to do that. Hmm. I think they're waking up now because they're starting to see, Ooh, Let's see. Do we want to keep putting money into these pots just on a defensive level? You're talking about offense. That would be a major offensive deal that we could do, and we could capitalize on that, and it would save us money in the long run because we wouldn't be losing stuff, and we wouldn't be trying to prop stuff up in a defensive mode. Yeah, I agree. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch. But, yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple of years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of, of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm -hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah. And I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20 percent using the code Hunter 20. That's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. I mean, d frankly, it just from a <clears throat> protecting hunting standpoint and like advocate, it, it just almost doesn't seem like we should have to. It seems like people want the result of hunting inherently. They just, they don't know that, right? Doesn't it seem like it should be the des decision-making entity to be making those decisions to say, hey, listen, you want more bobcats. Great. You need hunting. So wh why is there a vote on a thing like that? It seems like it's like uh, pretty straightforward in that respect. Does that make sense? There's no education. There's no communication to the public. There is no one telling the public you need and this, hunting. And the same example that we just brought up there, they're like, I just want to know that there's a healthy population of bighorn sheep. I want to see them. I want to know that they're great. You need hunting. Nobody's telling them that it seems like that step should be eliminated. It's like, it, it, that's what I'm saying. It almost doesn't seem like we should have to, it should be protected for, for that very well, reason. And the, and, and, and the way that most states are, and we would like to try to do this. We'd like to be offensive about this. Well, offensive, not offensive. Um, but it, we would like to make sure that the general public doesn't have the ability to turn around and make wildlife management decisions. I agree. Seems like a no brainer. That's the, exactly what but, I'm saying. Is like, how does You know what? <laughs> to, to do that, we got to have the general public vote on it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's so. So there yeah. you go. So so if we, if we did this preemptive campaign to, to show the benefits of all wildlife and management and, and hunting resources and everything, you could probably get that accomplished after two or three or four years of messaging. Agree. Mm. But you got to have millions of dollars throughout the course of the year to plant the seed, because then you're going to plant it and the opposition is going to come back and say, no, they're wrong. They're a bunch of bloodthirsty, freaking killing sons of bitches and we shouldn't be killing anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's a proactive measure to try to get in place. And I think it would actually if you did it appropriately and you used a test market, you could get it done. But the voters are the ones that have to make the decision on how to take the how to take the ability for the voter to to contribute to the cause of the voting public.
Well, right. that's where it's the interesting case because there's there's obviously ground level fights and defensive fights that you know uh, groups like the Coloradans for you know what you guys are doing and and what some of these other groups are doing have to fight. You it is today in your backyard. You've got to do it. People or groups and organizations like ASPCA from a national level are running all of this awareness. They're driving a funding source to become, uh, you know, on the offensive. And, it, and what's so crazy about it is you watch like an ASPCA commercial and it's like, I would assume every or if not every 99.9% .9 of the outdoorsmen watching an ASPCA commercial don't want to see a dog starving. Don't want to see a dog beaten outside. Like sure. nobody wants that, but that that's the vehicle they use to peel at everybody's heart to then be able to do things on the backside that could affect a lot of the stuff that the sportsmen really take into consideration. So where it comes back to, uh, and, and frankly, Dan, I didn't even know there was an organization that all of these conservation groups are, you know, in, in cahoots with that remains in DC. And it's like, what the hell are they doing? What are they doing? They're fighting on a federal level okay, for what, what, what are you doing? Why are you not doing or mirroring what an ASPCA is doing uh, or a humane society is doing at a mainstream level to essentially be that offensive force to let all of the organizations at the state level fight the defensive battles that are in their backyard right now while building momentum to become an ability to have an offensive force, put these guys on their hills for once. Well, and that's, I think, I think things that, that we are doing here and I don't want to take the credit, but I will give credit where credit's due. We have generated so much momentum on what we're trying to accomplish based upon our successes. And and I want to say this, that the involvement that I've had at so many different levels, some very minimal, but everything that we've done since I've been involved on the conservation argument, rallying advocacy side, I could put an, a, a markup. I'm 23 and 0. We've never lost anything. And since the formulation of CRWM, we've never lost anything. I don't intend on losing this, but while we've been trying to promote and be proactive, We've constantly had to deal with a little flipping, you know, the gnat buzzing around your head because of the political institutions that have been created through appointments and through elections, and through agendas. And for what we try to do on our end, you're constantly in this battle and that battle, the commission, the legislature, the, you know, some sort of citizens petition on a municipal level or some sort of county in, intrusion or something. I mean, th there's things that we have engaged in that we thought we'd probably lose that, you know, the right always came out to be the right. And that's why you were so successful. Conservation has a story to tell holistically and broadly to the entire community. Well, what con what conversation does conservation be, be a part of if we don't tell it ourselves mm -hmm. and the associations have the ability to be able to turn around and do that. I'd love for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and all these other organizations to either pool their resources, like what we've tried to do in our own little circle here in Colorado. Look at our website. Look at some of the campaigns that we've driven out there. We did network television advertising in two consecutive winters to the tune of about 1,100 different commercials during the holiday season. We did that. Mm -hmm. We were talking about hunting, going out and killing bighorn sheep and turn around and, and trying to make sure that we were talking about outfitters and, and duck hunts. We were talking about conservation. And we did that. And we started to see a little bit of a message turn. And the reason that I got that idea to do it is because I sit on the Wildlife Council, which is that $3 million campaign that every sportsman contributes to through buying a fishing or a hunting license. There's only three of those in the country. Even at a state level, if the sportsmen and women would get their legislators to turn around and do something similar for an internal slash external education campaign. And then, but if they did it differently than what we did in 1998 here in Colorado, and they went to those other organizations and say, Hey, look, we got the legislature to allow us to raise a million dollars or $2 million or $10 million based upon a dollar or a dollar 50 that was taken out of the, the, that the hunter paid into the system. And we want you RMEF and we want in you NWTF to be able to help promote this. So you spend 50 or a hundred thousand dollars of your money for this state effort. And now we got $5 million. 
Now we advertise collectively on the benefits of hunting and fishing to the general public, just like what we're doing here in Colorado yep. and in Michigan and Oregon's got a subset of that as well. Why well, don't we have, I mean, we started this in 1998. Why is it there 25 other states that have that now? Yeah. Why is it there 40 states that have that now? Yeah. It's because sportsmen haven't taken it upon themselves and those other groups that we mentioned haven't led the charge to turn around and go to the legislature with sportsmen in tow to say, we need this and we want this for this campaign, but we're going to run the campaign. Yeah, We want our message to be out there. You don't have to show blood and guts. You don't have to show grip and grins. You don't have to show, you know, the, I mean, look, we're, we're dealing with stuff that we're trying to get people to actually acknowledge the harvest or the killing of something in some form or fashion. So no matter what, that 10% is not going to care over there, but that other 70 or 80% in the middle, is going to recognize the reason they see wildlife is because of this effort that they were educated about on network television, on social media, on the radio, on billboards, on buses, wherever the hell you put it. We don't do any of that except for in a, a, a few, few small states, Colorado combined. But those other organizations have the ability to do that and go to their general assembly from a state level and say, this is what we want. It's our money. This is how we turn around and want it spent. And we want to create this campaign to be able to message about the benefits of hunting and fishing. I, frankly, as far as like advertising to the non-hunting public, I, I, you probably would do well to take a, uh, you know, play out of the ASPCA and, and PETA's book is to say like it, what they're promoting is like these uh, neg neglected domestic animals and pets and stuff like that. I wouldn't think that our advertisements would have to feature hunting at all. It would just have to feature wildlife. healthy populations of wildlife. It's like, is that what you guys want? Great. Yeah. yeah. Here, send your money. Nineteen ninety nine a month. Yeah. The problem there, at least on a state level, and this is a criticism to some of these organizations, is a lot of the groups, RMEF, DU, I know especially, their state level organizations, when they raise money, it goes back to national. They can't yep. take it and spend it on state level initiatives. Mm. And so it goes back into a national fund. And I'm not saying that that national fund doesn't then contribute to the state, but that state who, I mean, at hand, it is the most relevant to them. It is their state chapters. They, they can't make that jurisdiction of where that goes. And that's a, that's a no, big but, flaw. But, but they have the, they have the ability to be able to contribute to those education and conservation. Efforts oh, absolutely. And, and just, I mean, just, Let's say, let's just hypothetically, you know, pull numbers out of my ass here. But I um, mean, you know, if you got, if you got 30 states that wanted to do that and Army F was on board for that and Army F was going to contribute $50,000 per state, that's $1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, big deal. But it would be, it would be a launching pad to where those other states that could then go to their legislators and say, we want this self imposed fee not a tax, but a fee on our licenses to help enhance these other efforts from these other associations. NWTF does the same thing. Mule Deer does the same thing. Ducks does the same thing. Yep. Pretty soon you got X amount of dollars plus a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, maybe half a million dollars from other organizations combined. Pretty soon you look and go, oh, huh, that's pretty substantial. We got three and a half yep. or four or five million dollars that's going into this pot that we can ad advertise and educate throughout the course of the year. First year, you're not going to be see, you're not going to see exponential increases in in acceptance or or participation in anything. And you're not trying to recruit and retain hunters. You're trying to educate about the benefits of hunting and fishing. That's one thing that we have going for us here because we established that that fee and that process in 1998. And outside of the wolf issue, which was bringing something in, not taking something away or out, we were successful in keeping all of those efforts at bay because of that campaign and because of some public messaging that we've had on the landscape, the hug a hunter program that everybody's seen at some point in time, that's what that was. We are now science in the wild. We changed it up. We had to modify and adapt because of the changing demographics and the, and the way the polling came about. Mm -hmm. So it's science in the wild. So we have game wardens, we have biologists, we have people in the field showing different things on commercials. We have light rail wraps and we have buses and, and, and billboards and we have, um, uh, social media campaigns and a variety of different things. I'm not saying that's going to be the solve all to say solving all the wildlife messaging issues, but it's not going to hurt. No. 
Now, I think the big thing, you know, you mentioned like, oh, we don't really have to show hunting to do that. In retrospect, just because of how people are short attention spans, which we've talked about earlier, and black and white, you kind of do have to talk about hunting. and You kind of do have to show hunting. Otherwise, I don't know if people will connect it to. So when a ballot initiative that says, hey, you know, do you want hunting on mountain lions and bobcats in Colorado? They're just like, no, I don't. Not connecting it to a conservation effort. Like you, you kind of, you can't just tuck it away. Like you got to come out with it. It's got to be clean and it's got to be presented correctly, but you have to talk about hunting. Otherwise I think people just bypass sure. it. Well, and I guess what I'm saying is just to, again, looking at those anti-hunting organizations, it's like in a, in a way they're not promoting like, Hey, the commercial is not, Hey, we're going to attack hunters rights Correct. and stuff. That's ultimately yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Right. right. But in the same way we would not say, hey, we want to go kill animals, mm -hmm. you know, even though that is a necessary means of achieving what the general public does want, which is yeah. thriving wildlife populations. Unless it's a ballot initiative. If it's a ballot initiative, you got to be more forward on it. Because if not, people are going to see hunting on the ballot and they're not going to connect it to our commercial about conservation and healthy wildlife. They just Sure. Want. So if, but in general, I agree. Sure. Just general conservation, healthy wildlife populations will raise money, will get attention, will get participation. But when it comes down to an actual voting initiative, if you're not forward on it, they're going to overlook it. They're not going to. Well, it's kind of upsetting, not, not just from a sense where it's like, you know, our rights as hunters, you know, could be taken away. But from a general uh, public standpoint, it's like they're being duped by these organizations to say, is. you know, hey, give us your money. And it's like, well, we thought you were going to be um, saving puppies, saving puppies and stuff, yeah. not taking away hunters rights and like affecting wildlife populations mm -hmm. and like uh, exact, you know. Everything that's happening here, basically. Mm -hmm. So they're they're being duped. They're lying to them. I think the thing that scares me is is that uh, one of the things that scares me is that why are we talking about this now? Seventy years, sixty years, fifty years after the fact that most of these organizations were formulated. Right. We're we're starting to see more of a. Um, ignorance of the general public because of their attention span because of what they seek and how they get their information i mean just through the data that we collected you know it was something some ungodly amount that was like 55 percent of all women between the age of 24 and 34 got most of their news from facebook mm -hmm. uh well for christ's sake if that's what we're going to do then we're going to be screwed tw 20 years from now mm -hmm. because well, all their kids are going to get it from some other format too i mean put yeah. the economic circumstance on top of that is like you know, compared to 23 years ago, it's like, dude, we're all just trying to survive. We're all too busy working, trying to make money. To, and it's like the little bit of time that we do have for entertainment or news intake or whatever. It's like you said, it's the short attention span. So it's just like, we're, we're more useless than ever before mm -hmm. in the, in that sense. When, when, when are people most likely to pay attention is when it's going to affect or benefit them. Yep. And, and, uh, I mean, you know, I just visualize some of these things that the guy wants to go buy a new car. He wants to buy a new car. He goes to the Ford dealership and it's all electric. And he goes to the Chevy dealership and it's all electric. He goes to the Dodge dealership and it's all electric. Is he going to want to buy a car now? Maybe. Or is he going to keep looking for that one option mm -hmm. that where he doesn't have to buy an electric car? Uh, we, we, we go to the, the reason that we have choices in our lives is because we have personal preferences. We have personal preferences on our politicians. We have personal preferences on our housing and lifestyles. We have personal preferences on, on if we like blondes and brunettes, if we like whiskey and beer, if we like, you know, chicken and beef or tofu and jackfruit, you know, we have personal preferences, but when it comes to what benefits all of us, the personal preferences may be misconstrued people's perceptions mm -hmm. because of their personal preferences. If you don't want to hunt, fine. But just acknowledge the fact that yeah. you get benefit well off of me hunting, whether, whether, whether I'm successful or not. Use my example of the elk hunter. 91% of the people pay for the opportunity to go mm -hmm. just so they can go. But everybody and every species benefits point in, t point in case 58% of all revenue generated through Colorado Parks and Wildlife's Game Cash Fund. Not the park side, not all the other crap that's included in grants. Game Cash Fund, 58% is generated by non-resident elk hunters. 58%. Yep. They all got a, they all got a stake in the process. Yeah. But 
only a certain amount of them are taking something home, but they're paying in six or seven or eight hundred dollars for the privilege of being able to go to another state and pursue. Who the hell does that at any level? Yeah, a lot Besides of people, sportsmen and women. frankly, uh, sportsmen and women. Well, yeah, sportsmen. That's even looking in Ohio, I mean, I don't know. I would be curious to know what it is across all the states. In Ohio, 70% of the license bill is footed by non residents. And I'd have to yeah. imagine the success rate is, it can't be far off of what Colorado is. Probably not. I mean, how many people do you know from back east that would say, well, I'm going to pay $800 for the chance to go camping in Colorado? Nobody. Once I get there, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to go, <laughs> but it's going to cost me $800 and I get the chance to be able to do it. It's just like my analogy about going to the grocery store. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we do for the chance of being able to provide to the system. And the thing is, we don't just do it on elk. Then we turn around and do it on deer. Yeah. Then we do it on bears. Then we do it on duck and waterfowl and trapping and fishing and everything else. We do it repeatedly through the course of the year on a variety of different things. How many other people would do that if they had a chance to go mountain biking and rock climbing and cross-country skiing and camping? But they had to pay a fee to be able to do that. But they didn't know whether they're going to be able to do it or not. Yeah. Well, hunt, hunting is unique, I think, in that aspect. Frankly, I don't know what other activity uh, is like it in the sense that it's like you are you can be successful even if you aren't successful in the sense of a, of a harvest. You know, it's, we're going for the experience. You know, 90 percent of the people that aren't successful, if you had polled them, probably said they were successful. They're like, hey, I, that's what I went out to do. Well, I went out for the look, chance, for the opportunity. Look at Colorado and most of the other western states, and I'm not so sure about the eastern states, but when you apply for a license out here, you have to buy a qualifying license. Yep. So you have to buy a small game and a fishing license or a small game license, which costs you to get into the pot to, to apply. Yep. Then you got to buy preference points if you want to have any better chance. Then you have to have an application fee. You add that up, you got 100 bucks, 150 bucks, 200 300 dollars just to apply, not to get the license, just to apply for the license. And then when you don't get the license, you still have a small game license or a fishing license yep. that you bought to apply for that most people are never going to be able to use. Right. They don't ever do anything with it because they're not going to come back here to hunt rabbits. And we're probably. happy to pay it. We're happy to pay every, yes. every year. You know, I don't, I don't know what my bill in Montana is at this point, but it's like <laughs> every year I send them whatever it is, 1200, yep. 1100 bucks. And it's like, I get 800 of it back when I don't draw the tag. And it's like, I'm, I'm happy for them to have it. You know, I want it to go to a good cause, you know, because you know where it's going and what, what, what cause it's going to. Why don't we, why aren't we able to promote and profess that we are the most balanced, logical stewards of wildlife on the planet? Mm -hmm. We're paying into a system that nobody else even recognizes that we have until we tell them. And we don't tell, we don't tell them often enough to let them know that we're just paying for the opportunity to apply. Then we, then we just pay for the opportunity to pursue. And some of us are lucky enough to pay for the opportunity to harvest. Hmm. They don't, they don't, they don't get that message. And I think it's the game agencies. I think it's the organizations and when it really boils down to it. I think the sportsmen, because we're in charge of it. We buy the licenses. We're members of all the associations. Yeah. You know, or we, or we talk about defense and offense. Well, I'm about tired of being on defense too, but I'd like to know how to be on offense because hmm. the mechanisms are there. We just don't utilize it. It's like having a designated hitter that hits a home run every time that he gets up there, but we never let him get to the plate. Yeah, man, it's almost like uh, without the anti-hunting population, like there, there would essentially be no need, no, no discussion at all. Like it's solely because the I mean, it's almost like, you know, I think it would be fair to ask, like, what is your place in the conversation of wildlife management? What good has PETA or ASPCA ever done for wildlife? Is there anything? Is there any benefit ever? Has there ever been? You know, so what qualifies them to be a part of or even be able to influence the general public? Uh, it, emotions it's increasingly yeah upsetting on on my end to just admit you're just lying to everybody so different than the presidential because of, campaigns and PACs and where the money comes sure. in or what they tell you on the politics commercials just to get you to power and personal want. preference that's it and it's Slay. an industry it's an industry it's a it's, machine and it's an industry the animal rights extremist community is an industry look how many people on our side at chapters and associations are volunteer <sighs> Yeah. Very few of those some bitches are volunteer. There's paid people in every single freaking position at every single level, and they are a money driven machine mm -hmm. generated, sure. generating money, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to stop what actually fuels their fight. I, I often joke with some of my adversaries, you know, when we're all done, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You can be in the food line, 
Yeah. You know, or you're going to be so well, well funded, then you'll just be retired because if you don't have anything to fight, what reason do you have mm-hmm. to fight? Right. Yeah. They'll think- keep going. They'll go after cattle. They already go off of like horse racing and stuff like that. They'll, they'll keep pummeling down the line. <laughs> yeah. And hunting is such, such a complex, like, uh, I mean, even for me to understand, you know, when people ask you like, what's the, uh, what's the, uh, the thought process, you know, as you, you know, during hunting and, and the killing of an animal harvesting, it's like, man, I, in a lot of ways, like, just like you said earlier, when I see those commercials that are appealing to like the heartstrings of, I mean, that's a suffering, animal. I say, I hate that more than, more than anybody, for sure. More than the ASPCA, you know, the people, mm-hmm. for sure. Even to the point of, and this is where it's conflict, like a lot of hunters, I'm sure feel this way. Like even when I kill an animal, which is part of hunting, it's like that part of it, it it's hard. It, yeah. t- it tears at me. Like, it's like hunting is a hard truth. Mm-hmm. Like I very much enjoy the pursuit and I acknowledge the benefit to the general public of me doing it. Right. Mm-hmm. I see the, the money that goes into conservation, you know, the, um, the population management that's happening like as a result of that, but the killing of that animal is, is frankly something I wish didn't have to happen. Yeah. There is no way around it. I, I realize that as a hard truth, like that, mm. that is, that's what it is. That's, yeah. that, that's what it is. It just is what it is. Well, and that's where the, the hard disconnect is with a lot of this. Like, you know, I, I still challenge like any extremist to tell me that they care about, deer more than I Well, do. show me. Don't just tell me. Show me. That's where you I said don't. earlier to the, the organizations, what have you done for I wildlife? Ten, I spend tens of thousands of dollars a year like contributing to native habitat and wildlife populations on properties that I've spent hundreds of thousands <laughs> sure. of dollars on. You don't do any of that shit. Sure. And I would imagine that their answer is like, well, look at what we did with the wolves. We just put new wolves back in. It. Okay, what was the result of that? You know, it's like you have a detriment to these other populations and stuff. Well, they and- think it's going to reset this ecological system to you know, create, you know, manage these species. That's then going to create better wildflowers here. And like, it's a domino effect. And, and the reality is, is it doesn't. It's just, pretty uneducated approach. It just doesn't work that way. It's like, okay, yeah, exactly. well, wolves were here before. Let's reintroduce them. Well, so were dinosaurs. Should I bring them back as well? well? And, and like, so, so the- weren't people. So it's like, you know, we're the one element that they're not willing to sacrifice on. It's like, we're here now. It's yeah. like, if you wanted the things to go back to normal, we would leave. The system has changed. <laughs> it, it is it is a completely different system that, frankly, we all have to adapt to. Wildlife populations, plant populations, everything has to adapt to the new system that we're in. You can't just go back and say, well, they were here naturally. Yeah. Let's reintroduce We're them. here now. The resource has to be managed. We've gotten to a point in Colorado for sure that, that, uh, well, we've become, we've become the poster child at so many different levels because of our politics and because of the, the, the moving population that comes into here, you know, I mean, just to give you some other statistics, because I like statistics, but it, but it proves the point. We got 5.9 million people in the state, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming combined don't have that. We had 84 million visitors in 2022, and those three states combined had 33 million people. Uh, at any given time in Colorado, there's between 7.2 and 8.5 million people on the landscape at any given time. Wow. You know, whether they're traveling, whether they're visiting, whether they're moving here or vacationing or, you know, living here or whatever. I don't know, but, you know, I, people say, well, I'm speaking for the wolf. <laughs> well, that's great. Um I think we need to speak for wildlife, but I think we need to speak for wildlife as as a species and as an ecosystem, not as a blade of grass in a lawn. Mm-hmm. I think individual components of what they bring to the table, people bring to the table to speak on behalf of of one segment of the of the ecological system. Mm-hmm. I think is that's like speaking for a blade of grass. I know that I got a good good yard when I'm when I'm manicuring a yard. Not that I have a yard, we have a pasture, but we manage it. Yeah. But I don't have to know how many blades of grass or how many cactus or how many weeds or anything else are out there because I know it's it's ecologically balanced and sound. Mm-hmm. What they want to do is they want to pesticize one animal. And they want to utilize that one animal that was killed because it attacked a goat or it harassed a person or it attacked a mountain biker. They want to utilize that one animal as an example, as a sacrificial lamb. Yeah. They don't talk about the generalized concept of the entire species, whether it's in state or out of state or combined throughout North America. 
it's easy for them to turn around and point the finger about how bad somebody is and what they do or what they don't do. But when they look at their own rank and file, their own data and statistics, they are the biggest hypocrites. And they, and they throw out the most hyperbole that's out there amongst anybody talking about these issues. Yeah. Because their agenda is to stop it. Yeah. Period. We yeah. talked about the oil and gas. We talked about the, the, uh, solar farms. We talk about the wind turbines and the wind energy farms and stuff. Have you heard anything about the wind farms off the East coast in the last two months since the whales had beats themselves? And now it became a threat that we were going to talk about, well, they didn't do that until we put a bunch of windmills out there. Mm-hmm. Is that the fact or is it the fact? I don't know, but you don't hear about it anymore, but yeah. I hear the whales are still beating themselves, but we're not blaming it on wind. It's because it's agenda-driven politics on a variety of different levels, and it doesn't matter what it is. They will utilize whatever we have that's factual against us. They'll use whatever we have that's scientific against us. They'll use whatever we have that's anecdotal against us because all of their stuff that they bring to the table is right, and mm-hmm. everything that we have is wrong. It's selfish. And the prime example, prime example of that's going to be this fall when they throw out all of the lies and deceit and the freaking fallacies and the misnomers about how mountain lions have been inappropriately managed and indiscriminately killed for some foreign market for bobcats and and for a cruel, inhumane poaching, you know, uh, some sort of a ring that we've got behind the scenes. Um, And nothing can be further from the truth, but it's our job to build up an advertising campaign that if we would have done this 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, we wouldn't have had to do it the last minute. It would be an ongoing knowledge about how things happen. And we had to do a little bit of stuff, but we wouldn't have to do it to the magnified proportions that we are now. So, Dan, um, just kind of tying it all together, every, everybody listening to this, obviously, you know, I, I think we've done a pretty good job of, of discussing through that this isn't just a, a Colorado issue and that a lot of the things, including this uh, ballot initiative, is a big you know, precedent setter, possibly for a lot of other states. So how can people find out more information about your group, um, looking at opportunities for donations? Where where can they find that out? Well, I want to say, that, like I said, I think I said on here that, that we've taken donations in from 50 states and, and some of them might be $10 a month. Some of them might be a one-time $20 donation. Uh, we've taken $100,000 donations in. We've raised more money in, in 14 weeks, 15 weeks, than the two anti-wolf campaigns did in 19 months back in 2020. Wow. The enthusiasm has spread so far and wide because I think people were just sick and tired of extremist ideas trying to alter the course of North American model management objectives, science-based objectives, and just the fact that we don't profess to stand up And I think this is an opportunity to stand up. This is an opportunity for everybody to get engaged and get involved. And and to that point there, what I always say to that point, look at, we had 192,000 sportsmen and women that applied for licenses in the state of Colorado last year. A lot of those were non-residents. If they would take the money that they have to spend on a qualifying license or preference points or application fees, and just for this year, double it and send us the same amount of money that you're not that not the license fee itself. Send us the application fee. That way we can continue to fight so they can continue to apply. If they're willing to give the state a donation just for the uh, opportunity to apply, give us a donation so we can turn around and help sustain wildlife management and perpetuity so you can continue to fight with us and apply and maybe have a resource that you want to hunt when you draw that tag with those preference points save the hunt colorado.com is 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 the the website that we've had for the last six years people can go there and easily donate if they don't want to donate through there they can donate uh through the post office box that's listed on the website it's post office box 387 in canyon city colorado We're not looking for handouts. We're looking for for help to build an army because it's not a Colorado issue. If you're interested or concerned about what's going on in the Western United States or maybe in your state because you see other things that are happening, help us put a flag in the sand to where we can claim a victory on this and other issues and then build a playbook 
and a roadmap and an armament up that we could give other states. We got other states reaching out. How the hell did you do this? What are you doing so effective? We can't raise $15,000. You're saying you raised a million and a half already. How do we turn around and do what you're doing? We want to help build that roadmap and that playbook. We've hired the experts. We've got a strategy team that is that is second to none. We've got a legal team that's second to none. We have partners that are second to none. We have a movement that is being created through the agriculture and through the conservation community, the hunk, hook and bullet hunting and angling side of things that is monumental. It's never been at this pace. I said I was on 40 different podcasts. When you start getting guys like Joe Rogan talking about conservation efforts and mentioning me and our organization and our efforts, you got Cameron Haynes, you got Steve Ranella, you got Randy Newberg, you got Jim Shockey, you got all the big guys that are paying attention. Then all the guys that we're riding the coattails on with all of you, you know, the, the Chris Powell's with Houndsman XP, uh, I did Jonathan Redbeard, Cable Smith. I mean, you, you're you not all in competition together. You're all trying to spread a message for yeah. continuity and consistency to message to our community as a whole. 14 million sportsmen and women in the United States, uh, not counting all the anglers at different levels. We ought to be able to turn around and raise the flag and say, no more. Mm -hmm. No more in Colorado, no more in Wyoming, no more in Oregon, no more in Utah, no more in Ohio, no more in Florida. I told a story the other day that's probably one of the most inspirational stories outside of a kid that I dealt with last year. A 70-year-old guy writes us a handwritten cursive letter and sends $250, and he tells me, he says, I'll never be able to hunt Colorado, but I hope that there's somebody like you here in Florida when they come from my gator trapping. Hmm. Those are the type of things that people are stepping up. I got a check from a guy. He called me the other day, two days, two days ago, he calls checks, check goes right to the freaking web or the, to the um, uh, website, a thousand bucks. And he tells me this is not the only thousand I'm going to spend. We got guys spending $20 a month, guys spending $20 a week. This is a movement. I could go down the list, and I think you guys would be surprised if I read a list of 300 donations that we get in a week that are $20 or maybe $1,000, 85% of them are non-residents. Right. Because they see the value that the wolf is not only at our door, the wolf is at their door. It's just that maybe he hasn't turned around and tried to breathe the door down with fire yet, but they know he's in the neighborhood. And if we lose here in Colorado, the West, in a state where they're trying to take cowboy hats away for sale, and, and lamb at restaurants through a slaughterhouse ban or fly fishing material or ban the harvest of mountain and bobcats, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you what, it ain't Colorado. It's just that Colorado happens to be the spot where the, the pickings are so ripe and the landscape is so purpose, purposeful and perfect for them, for the opposition, that I, you know, I, I try to sound enthusiastic and pump this up. This is not a one-off for us. I've been doing this for the last 15 years and we've never lost. And I don't intend on losing now, but we can't do it by ourselves because of the, the juggernaut that is coming at us from out of state money to, de to defeat our efforts to manage wildlife. Mm -hmm. Carol Baskins with Lion or Tiger King or whatever the hell it is. She's a spokesperson for them. What the hell does she know about mountain lions and bobcats in Colorado or wildlife management or the North American model? Samantha Brueger with Cats Aren't Trophies used to work for Wild Earth Guardians. She got hired by Wayne Pacelli of the HSUS, who runs the Animal Welfare Protection for a Humane Economy. He's the guy in charge. He hired her. This is national stuff that they're coming here because they see that the landscape might be ripe for the pickings because trapping of bobcats with cages, hunting of bobcats, and, and hunting of mountain lions is the low-hanging fruit. And they want to turn around and knock us off the planet because they know that we're the low hanging fruit, but we're probably the buzzsaw that they didn't plan on moving into. And if we defeat them here, you watch them backtrack, you watch them pedal back and go, crap, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. But if they win here, they're going to go, where are we going to go next? Yeah. Double down. And, and I, you know, it just, I mean, it sounds like a rah, rah speech, but I can tell you, Look at our Facebook. Look at our Instagram. The Instagram is CRWM. Facebook's Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. SaveTheHuntColorado.com is the website. You can get the videos. You can see 
exactly the language on the initiatives, Initiative 91. And you can also read another initiative that they proposed that we defeated in the Supreme Court through the title board that we forced them to withdraw. So then they got stuck with this initiative that they're working on. They're working on gathering signatures now. They get there. That process will be into a campaign. It'll be on the ballot. we got so many things behind the scenes that are going on that, that, that I can't reveal at this point in time. But maybe three or four months down the road, if you guys are happy enough with this outcome, that you might be able to have me back on for a little bit just to say, this is where we're at. This is what we're doing. And this is the success that we've got so far because we are going to beat them. It's just we want people to be part of the success and the victory as opposed to sitting back in January of 25, looking back to November of 24 and go, well, we didn't help that. Mm -hmm. Sure. This yeah. is an opportunity for everybody. Conservation, North American model, science-based wildlife management, our history, tradition, and heritage on the community nationwide. And look, we, we manage wildlife on a nationwide level when it comes to excise taxes, Pittman, Robertson, and Dingle Johnson. The, the national organizations that we all got that we're members of are trying to do things best for all, all of our efforts. But the state efforts need as much help as what the national side does. And we're just asking for people to pay attention, educate themselves, engage, and hopefully donate. Good message, Dan, Pretty man. Good. Great, great information. We appreciate you, you know, taking better part of three plus hours here to, to go through <laughs> it with us. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, often because of the way society is and the way that life is, is that, you know, even as like dedicated sportsmen, we put blinders on and, and, you know, you put earmuffs on and you don't see and hear these things that are in the peripheral. Um, so, you know, having this conversation and, and, you know, everybody listening to this has a better understanding of what's going on, a better realization of like this, this is a thing that is happening and it's going to continue to happen unless we, you know, kind of put our foot down here and, and bond together and do something about it. So, man, we, we appreciate it. We appreciate your efforts out in, in Colorado doing that and, and even just educating everybody nationally on it because the unfortunate thing is I think a lot of us are just completely naive to it. Like, we, we don't know. We don't know what to do. We don't know what's happening and going on. And so just conversations like this continue to bring more light to that and, you know, that can only help in my opinion. I appreciate the effort with you guys and the opportunity look forward to future conversations. And if there's anything else that we can provide from out here, maybe other people or states can learn from our efforts and, uh, and see just how successful we are. And, you know, with the efforts that you guys are doing to let us ride your coattails, it's just, it's remarkable because it's not just a one-off. This is, a, it's just building steam and momentum. And, and uh, I, I see it from the shows and from the outreach and from the celebrity guys and, from the podcast and it's just this is a movement it's not within this the boundaries or state lines of colorado the centennial state it's a movement and uh movements you know take a little bit to take hold but uh, i see a hell of a lot of headway that we're making and uh and not much resistance from our community we just need everybody's support so i love it, it man i i hope that a year from now or two years from now we can have the same conversation but it's because of the offensive things that we're yep. we're doing you guys ever get out this direction, uh, let me know. We can grab a beer or maybe we can try to uh, dip a line somewhere. Heck uh, yeah, man. That would yeah. be awesome. Very good. Appreciate it. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Sever. Well, one of the biggest things that we always talk about is what our arrow setups are. And this year we're shooting the Sever broadheads. I think we're both shooting the new two inch titanium broadhead. And so, you know, we're huge proponents of expandables. And I know we've had this argument back and forth with people, but we just we're, we're right and you're wrong and that's you just need to accept it. we just want to have a giant wound that pumps out blood that's the bottom line we build our arrow setups and shoot bows you know to maximize penetration and we shoot broadheads that are gonna give us the best blood trails you know the most hemorrhage possible uh, and so part of those setups is we're also shooting the eastern arrows here coming up pretty soon so we've, yep. we've shot the victory in the past mm -hmm. and you know there's all kind of great arrow shafts on the market but like we're looking for a whole system from broadhead to arrow components to the arrow shaft itself and, uh, you know, the more we look at some of these Eastern shafts and the components that go with them, that setup's going to be really deadly for us. Yeah, I'm actually using the Eastern traditional axis right now uh, in my traditional setups for both my recurve and my longbow. I've got a 100 grain brass insert on those. And then obviously I'm using a fixed blade broadhead on, on those specific shafts. Right on. 
So, but yeah, our goal is always to be shooting the best broadhead that we think is going to be the most lethal for our setups. We've done plenty of research. We believe in the Sever broadheads, and we hope you would check them out at Sever Broadheads as well. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, it's it's foreign to us how a lot of that political side stuff works, and it you know it also just like anything you know you mentioned general election and stuff, and it's like. You know, for anybody who really is passionate about this stuff, it may, it pisses you off. Mm -hmm. You're just angry about it because it's like these idiots don't know what they're asking for. They're selfish. And then, you know, people Speaking like... Speaking to antis. Yeah, people like Carol Baskin wanting to protect big cats of, like, mountain lions because she thinks that hunting is going to eradicate them. Meanwhile, per the statistics, we've increased them, you know, over a hundred... Like, what? A hundredfold? Tenfold? Tenfold, over tenfold, right. you know, twentyfold actually, and it's you know it's just naive blabbermouths on platforms with money behind them trying to do something that they have no idea what is actually right or wrong, and it's going to ruin everything. It's going to explode in their face, and it's going to come back to where they're like, "Well, would you want us to do about it?" It's like you started this, you ruined this. Now future generations don't have mountain lions to see and observe and be part of the environment in the future because of what you did. And you're not going to take any responsibility for it. Sure. You're going to just be like, well, I don't know. Same with, like you said about the, well, there is no long-term objective. I mean, it's just right here, right now. We, we want it to stop. We, we want animals not to get killed. It's, and it's a, it's an honorable, right? I get it. I, I, I can, I, I can understand, but animals, animals have been killed for, Tens of thousands well, of that's years. That's what I said. Is it's it's a hard truth, right? It they have they have to. They're yeah. here for our consumption. You know, if we want a future, right? Like the resource has to be managed, and that does yeah. mean harvesting a portion of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you don't want you know to shoot a deer ever again, and you also never want to be able to establish a garden unless it's in an eight foot tall fence, like that's, yeah. That's well, the and there's good news, great news. You don't have to. And frankly, yeah. there's not enough of the resource for all of us to do that. So, mm. you know, we're not saying everybody has to hunt. In fact, not everybody can hunt. You know, I mean, there's, but there are opportunities for a select few of us to, you know, and there's, I say a select few, but there's, there's a lot of hunters there that mm. have the ability to have a positive impact on the management of that resource moving forward. And for somebody that doesn't like it for themselves to say that, you know, that can't happen, it's, it's, extremely irresponsible frankly and furthermore yeah. to influence the general population that go. that's how it that's has to be the big one that's negligible that's the that's the big one because ultimately it's fine like i don't care if you don't like me for it i don't care if you don't ever want to do it i don't even care if you don't want to see it anymore but to influence Good. more people, you yeah to influence <laughs> people who have have are naive to it and have no idea to then become against it to then end it for me shady shady yeah, and, and, and it's not even that. I mean, because people could say, well, that's selfish because you want it for you. Yeah, it is. But the reality is, is like hunting is needed from a conservation aspect. Without hunting, you then have sharpshooters and government government people well, coming in and doing that. It's yeah, necessary. it's an absolute necessity to wildlife management. It's foundational to how this has been done for, for many, many years. So when you get into these standpoints of these people throwing just – you know, and, and it really comes down, this is why I brought up the offensive thing, is like they're just going to continue to throw random noodles at the wall and hoping one sticks. And one sticks, then they're going to build on that momentum, mm -hmm. right? And at some point, we can only be the defense for so long. If we don't go on the offense, they will win. N noodles will stick against the wall, and those will lead to others sticking against the wall. And eventually, it's the decline of what we know as what, how we hunt and fish in this country right now. Um, so if we don't go on the offense and put them back on the hills, make them spend money on defense, it's not going to end well. We can only do defensive tactics for so long. And right now in a lot of states, they have to. What, the, what does offense from our perspective look like? I mean, offense looks like getting hunting and fishing rights into the state's bill of, uh, bill of rights, okay. right? Making oh, it well, a right to and where. So why? What, what is the objective of, of an offensive stance? If you want to use a specific, like, Pennsylvania, whatever. So Pennsylvania would be a so great because, case like, of we, Bill of Rights. I would say it's objective a right now. is we want, we want a healthy population of Correct. game resources, right? Yep. And so an offensive move would be in an effort to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. Correct? 
Yeah, but not just so much in the in the manner of the resource as it is also in things like hunting as a, a whole. Like we can't let conservation also just be the forefront leader to where we don't talk about hunting because hunting is looked at as negative. If we do that, well, so then is hunting, hunting will never be recognized. Is hunting the objective or is it a, a vehicle for conservation? Hunting or both. Conservation is a vehicle to protect hunting. Okay, how so? Because people like conservation. Right. They're receptive of it. They want to see the elk. They want to see the bighorn sheep. They yeah. want to see the deer. In order to manage those healthy, healthy, you have to have hunting. Right. That's why I'm saying conservation is the goal. Hunting is the ve- you know, hunting is a vehicle. One, one see, of. I see it the other way around. I see it as hunting is the goal for us at this level. Nobody. Well, for us, nobody yeah. is threatening we to enjoy take hunting. conservation away. These these extremists are not threatening to well, take they conservation. They are by right. threatening to take hunting away. It's they're one and the same. Well, so that's why the vehicle is. That's what's misleading. That's the whole misleading the thing I'm talking is about. Conservation. We ride conservation to protect hunting. Sure, in that sense, yes. It's it's our, it's in our interest to protect hunting because that's what we love. Mm-hmm. But speaking to the non-hunting public, we use conservation as conservation the is. Well, and it is the goal. Like we, we want conserved herds. We want to know that wildlife is there. We want thriving herds. I don't think it. I don't think it's under attack. That's it, it is because hunting is under attack. No, because they'll say, "Well, we can manage it with governor shoot with government shooters. We don't need you as hunters." You can't possibly. They think they can. I know and they I, think they I, can, but I, you can't. I don't can. know. I I don't doubt that. If there's there's five thousand uh, mountain lions in the. In the state of Colorado, you could hire well, a thousand that, hunters. To that go out is and an idiotic argument, though, because what's a dead animal is a dead animal. It's like you want taxpayer dollars to pay for government agencies mm-hmm. to just kill them all, or yes. do you want to bring money in from sport? I, that's what I'm saying. It's a, it's a moronic want, argument. No, no, because the argument is numbers. If there's no hunters, there's no 500,000 deer hunters in the state of Michigan. There's no 750,000 deer hunters in the state of Pennsylvania. There's 1,000 people who have been hired to go out and kill them. There is no power in numbers there. They win. Sure. Well, so that, I mean, that exposes, I think, the root of their cause is it's not to conserve. It's to not let us hunt. Correct. Yes. And, Which is why conservation is And you have the same number not, of dead animals at the end of the day. Conservation is not under attack necessarily. Hunting is un- under attack. Sure. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I, I view them as you can't have one without the other. They don't. They want you to view them the same, though, because they'll instantly throw back at you that we're not attacking conservation. And you'll say, you know, so you have to position Well, you are correctly. by attacking hunting because hunting promotes conservation. Hunting enables us to conserve. Enables conservation, sure. Yeah. But if you if you use conservation, and this is, I think, the fault of a lot of people, is they want to use conservation too too much. And then people are oblivious to hunting's rule in conservation. So if we ran a 30-second commercial and we spent $100 million educating people on how we all want healthy animals, we all want healthy animals, conserve, conserve, but we never talk about hunting in it, that does nothing for conservation. It does nothing for hunting. You have to talk about hunting, well, even if it's uncomfortable. It does if those dollars go, are going towards pro hunting organizations in the background. Yeah, because that's the same thing they're doing. But if you they're have, promoting, what do you say? Twenty six states have ballot initiatives. That's where you lose because you didn't educate them on hunting at all. How so? What do you mean? Because they'll vote and on. then they'll kill it. The ballot, which is what is happening with the mountain lions, doesn't. These guys can battle it all they want. It's up to the voters now to determine if mountain hunting, mountain lion hunting is going to be banned or not. Sure. That's what it comes down to. So even if you're funding people like what Dan's organization is mm-hmm. or, you know, other organizations, uh, MUCC in Michigan, the reality is, is if it goes to a ballot, you... A ballot, which is just a vote to the general public? To the general public okay. during the general election type cycles. Okay. Then... It is up to of how did you educate the public to say, in this case, hunting mountain lions is a good thing. Sure. And if I agree. all you did is pull, pull and right, push right, right. conservation talk, didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. You have to talk I about see. hunting. I see. And it's uncomfortable. That's that's the problem. So, is yeah, yeah, yeah. In that sense, you're saying the ballot is hunting or no hunting. It's exactly what it is. Yeah. And so if you only talk about conservation, you did nothing. Sure. You may have raised money. Okay, well, I, I guess I'm looking at it, and that is what is motivating. to be. That's the goal. That's what people want. Mm-hmm. And we're, yeah, 
the the goal of or the approach of that campaign would be to show how hunting is the vehicle. Yep, that's it. I get it. Kind of man, it's complicated. A lot. I'll frank a lot of that is over my head. Dan's obviously, yeah, like you said, no, it was an awesome conversation into the battle. So uh, that was Bo that connected us with with Dan, and so I appreciate it. He's very insightful on wolves, but I mean, it's a it's a much bigger issue. Much bigger issue. We we're experiencing it not as much in the east, just Mm -hmm. frankly because we have far fewer species to to fight over. Um, but also there's like a predatory element that they seem to just really glorify. Like well, the wolves, the grizzly bears, the potentially cute and cuddly, like cuddly yeah. from like it's a Disney the large perspective, carnivores but. that are a very, hold a very emotional tie into people's It is hearts. weird how they like draw the distinction between like a nuisance and a, sure. a you know, a big game or like yeah. a, a predator, frankly. Mm-hmm. Cause like I look at coyotes, it's like, that's a predator, mm-hmm. right? And they, you know, they are a nuisance. And some states are like, yeah, kill them all. Kill them all. But for some reason, wolves are different. It's like, yeah. I think a lot of it's more of a spiritual type of side. That's where the spiritual and emotional side of wolves coyotes and bears Coyotes are spiritual and stuff. animal, dude. People don't give a shit about coyotes. Yeah. Uh, the, even the extremists probably don't care about coyotes unless they throw them into the dog category. I bet if there wasn't a lot of them, they'd care a lot more of them. Yep, probably. Just the fact that it's just like, oh, yeah, no, they're essentially a weed right yeah. like from the standpoint that's like you yeah. can't control them even can't if you want to yeah it's like is an extremist going to fight for the value of wild hogs probably not yeah <laughs> maybe but like that would be that's not an easy that that's not a low-hanging fruit hmm. um yeah it's interesting but uh well cool well we appreciate everybody listening to this podcast 173 with dan gates and uh great information i take a little note from him at the end if you don't know already see who your local commissioner is see who uh you know your your local representative is senator is and and, and definitely there. check nick will put some links to their yep. website and stuff in the bottom of our uh description here so there you go and we'll catch you next week later it take me oh.